Well, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Good, good morning. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. We're obviously not going to gavel in or anything serious like that, um, but uh, we're calling it a workshop. I really appreciate all you coming here to see me. Uh, and it, it, this is an important discussion today. And I am eager to hear what our panelists have to say, what our experts have to say. But most importantly, we are all focused on securing our communications networks. If you're here, you've likely heard me talk a little bit about this issue and my views. We need to find insecure equipment in our networks. We need to fix the problem. We need to fund the process. Find it, fix it, fund it. And I'm particularly concerned about the threat posed by insecure equipment. These threats don't affect just individuals, just businesses. They go to the fundamental core of our notions of what it means to be a nation that is protected. Network security is national security. Our interconnected networks are only as secure as their most vulnerable pieces. Current efforts by the FCC with its supply chain proceeding, by Congress with the NDAA prohibiting government procurement of telecommunications equipment from certain Chinese companies, including Huawei and ZTE, and then of course by the administration with the May executive order barring U.S. companies from buying foreign-made telecommunications equipment considered to be a national risk. And all of these folks have taken steps prohibiting or restricting insecure equipment going forward. And I applaud those steps. What I'm focused on, what those actions are not addressing is an equally critical problem. That is the equipment that is already in our networks. The threat is real and it is here. We need solutions. We cannot treat this issue asymmetrically, where we're focusing strictly on how to keep insecure equipment uh, with a national security risk out of our network going forward, but we fail to address the equipment that is already here in our networks. The issue is, of course, of great importance to me and to all Americans. It's important that we bring as much expertise as possible as we think through these complex issues. So I'm excited for today's gathering, including stakeholders from uh, throughout um, uh, the cross-section here, carriers, manufacturers, academics, industry experts, all of us in an effort to start crafting and developing a practical path forward. And I'm not the only one thinking about these hard questions. I know there are folks in the room here, staff members from the U.S. House and, of course, from the Senate who are with us this morning. I'm glad that members of Congress and their staff are here engaged on this issue and look forward, of course, to working together as we all think through these issues. This forum, I think, is particularly fitting because it is going to require a public private partnership. For example, we're going to need private carriers with insecure equipment in their network to come forward to raise their hand so that we can work with them to fix this issue. And for the carriers that are present here today, I thank you for your leadership. But likewise, for this issue, it's going to require a whole of government approach that deploys uh, our technical and national security expertise and quite likely a funding package that drives the result that we all want, secure communications networks. And during this workshop, I really want us to break down and dig in to what it will take to find the insecure equipment, fix the problem, and fund the process. And so we're going to begin today with a description of these threats of having insecure equipment, including potentially, um, including what we know of Huawei equipment in our networks by Mr. Jim Lewis and Professor Jonathan Mayer. They're going to frame our discussions and set the stage for uh, the rest of our morning. And then our first panel is going to explore the threats uh, and the risks posed by insecure equipment currently in our communications networks. We need to know where in the U.S. this equipment is located and consider what equipment poses the threat. There is an active debate over whether all Chinese equipment, Huawei equipment, poses a threat or whether some of it is safe or could be made safe. And some of those issues are what I hope to explore. The second panel is going to focus on how to fix the problem. We need to transition carriers away from insecure equipment as rapidly as possible. Mitigation of risk may be possible, but a rip and replace approach may be required. 
And no matter what, we should minimize disruptions to Americans and to our consumers. We need to consider the options and what will be best for every American in these networks. And finally, our third panel is going to figure out, uh, help us think through how to fund a solution. We cannot expect carriers to replace this insecure equipment alone. This is a national problem. It needs a national solution. And many of the carriers who purchase this equipment are, of course, small and operate in rural areas and may not be able to, of course, cover the costs without financial support. Recent legislation uh, proposed to allocate a $700 million number to fund the problem. Other estimates are upwards of a billion or more. Depending, of course, on what equipment needs to be replaced, the timing of that replacement, and many other variables. So that's a lot of ground for us to cover today. Uh, but one thing, of course, is crystal clear. We cannot afford to compromise our national security. So let's get started. The security of our networks depends on it. So first up will be Jim Lewis, Senior Vice President at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Many of you know Jim. He has deep experience on these issues as a foreign service officer, as a political and military advisor, among numerous other roles. He's testified before Congress on many occasions, is internationally known on the issue of cybersecurity. After him will be Professor Jonathan Mayer, Professor of Computer Science and Public Policy at Princeton, uh, was formerly the Chief Technologist here at the FCC's Enforcement Bureau. His research in particular focuses uh, on understanding at a technical level the nature nature of threats presented by insecure equipment in our communication networks. And he's also re researching the technological means of identifying insecure equipment in networks. So Jim, get us started. Well, thank you, Commissioner. and. Um, Good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm going to do a quick overview of some of the aspects of the threats created by the use of this technology. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes. I'm going to take 10 of them, and the other speakers will have the rest, and we'll move to the panel. Um, so about a decade ago, there was a debate in China between people you might call uh, the nationalists and the internationalists, the one who said, no, we should behave more according to international law and international norms and standards. And the bad news is that the internationalists lost that debate. Um, we've seen under President Xi um, significant changes in Chinese policies. And he has decided that it's time to confront the US, right, and the, to displace the US. That's the core of the problem here in some ways, is that much of the equipment we're using when it comes from China is coming from a confrontational power, some might even say a hostile power. Uh, that's a difference from the China of 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but it's the China we have with now. I think we can look at three categories of threats. Uh, the economic threat, the threat of coercion, and the threat of espionage. Um, Economic is that uh, China has industrial plans. Some of them work, some of them don't. But the thing you can say about the Chinese is they are committed, they are willing to spend uh, billions of dollars to achieve uh, dominance in some key technologies. Huawei is the poster child for this industrial policy. It's gone from being basically one person's vision 20 years ago to the second largest producer of telecom equipment in the world. That's largely due to two things. Um, Chinese subsidies and preferential treatment in the China market. The chairman of Huawei, Ren, has even said if the Chinese government hadn't blocked foreign suppliers, there would be no Huawei. And it's also due to espionage. A lot of what Huawei offers and sells is the result of commercial espionage. This goes back at least two decades. I mean, I was laughing. The Poles arrested a Huawei employee a few months ago for espionage. The circumstances were almost exactly the same as the US arresting a Huawei employee for espionage in 2004 at one of the big trade shows in Chicago. So a consistent pattern of espionage that builds to their, lets them save money on R&D. Now, China's willing to support R&D, and Huawei has achieved um, a level of technical competence that's enviable, but it's built on the basis of espionage, and they haven't stopped. The last case I saw was December of 2018. So you have this economic issue, which is what would the US feel like if it depended on a foreign supplier for this core technology? 
Um, the second issue is coercion. The Chinese um, are perfectly happy to flex their muscles. When Australia banned Huawei, uh, the Chinese immediately cut exports of uh, Australia's largest export to, to China, which was coal. They put an immediate block on it. You're seeing this now play out with the rare earth threats. They've done that before. This is a country that's willing to use coercion. So one of the things you could think about is um, under what circumstances would you want China to have the ability to disrupt telecommunication services, to turn off phones in, uh, in a particular area or in a country, to um, reduce service quality, to make one out of every three calls drop. You know, this could be a useful tool in trade negotiations, in a, in a dispute over, uh, over man-made islands. Um, it's a tool of coercion that the Chinese would acquire if people use uh, Huawei equipment. I think the next panel will go through some of the details of how this might be managed or if it can be managed. You have a real debate. If you talk to the Australians, they tell you the only way to reduce the risk is to ban Huawei entirely. If you talk to the Europeans, they say, no, there's an intermediate compromise, a partial ban and geographic restrictions. It's a good topic to talk about. The third issue is, of course, espionage. So to put this in context, um, China is now the single largest uh, espionage actor in the world. It has a massive global espionage campaign. It's focused on both political information, the kind of thing every country does, but also on uh, acquiring technological information. So they are the leaders by far more than any other country in terms of stealing other people's technology. If you ride the high-speed train from the airport in Shanghai to downtown, um, it's really a German design with some Japanese stuff in it. Uh, but of course, it's not under license. So the new Chinese airliner, kind of the same story. So this is a country that has become the leading uh, opponent of the US in terms of espionage. And people in the intelligence community would describe it as reaching levels that surpass what we saw in the Cold War. That's kind of amazing, right? So one of the contexts here is that China uses espionage a lot. So how does that work with telecom? First, um, if any of you have ever done this, you know that knowing the plans, the layout, the technology gives you an advantage. And one of the examples I use is if you're the builder of the house, you know where the doors are, um, what floors are on, what the locks might be, where the cameras might be. So you get an advantage in terms of access. As you know, a lot of the, the big equipment calls home for updates, for patches. And the British, who had a monitoring center uh, to look at these updates and patches, concluded that they would be unable to detect if a rogue command came in or if big data was flowing out. The example that, that is the most, sometimes people say there's no smoking gun. There are plenty of smoking guns. The one that might be the most public is the Chinese built the African Union headquarters. You probably all know this story. And um, a couple months after it was completed, uh, the, the technicians at the African Union noticed that every night at two in the morning, there was a huge outflow of data going to Shanghai, right? that they weren't doing. So basically everything that was written that day was being reported back to China uh, that night. Um, that's the kind of thing you have to worry about, is that knowing the system, building the system, um, controlling the patches and updates uh, gives you a tremendous ability to coerce and to spy. In fact, one of the, you all know the game in cybersecurity called Capture the Flag. Uh, in cyber espionage, the game is called Capture the Updater. Huawei owns updater, and so people say, well, is there a back door? They don't need a back door, they have a front door, right? A very different situation. Um, there's a question about where you need to constrain Huawei. And so in the past, we did not constrain or restrict handsets. Um, the US has decided to do that. It's a topic for discussion, but one of the things to bear in mind is that the nature of intelligence gathering has changed because people now have the ability to use big data analytics and artificial intelligence, and the Chinese are leaders in this, um, to take masses of data that might have at one point seemed inconsequential, like what you're doing on your handset, um, and analyze it in a way that gives you intelligence advantage, that gives you counterintelligence advantage. Uh, so um, there's a definite risk here, and that's the one that I think comes to the fore. 
it's worth thinking about Huawei software. And so one of the British reviews done by GCHQ, their signals intelligence agency, found that uh, Huawei software was the buggiest of all the telecom software in the world, right? Well, that's a security risk there, right? But one thing people don't think about is that it's not just the Chinese who can exploit this buggy software. Anyone else who has a relatively robust capability for signals intelligence <clears throat> can take advantage of the fact that <coughs> Huawei software is vulnerable, right? Well, the British asked Huawei to fix one of the problems, and Huawei said they would get right on it, and they would have a fix within two years, right? That's not deeply encouraging. So it's not just China. And when you think of the Russians and some of the other people who might be really good at signals intelligence, if you buy Huawei, you are basically ceding a degree of your sovereignty, not just to China, uh, but to others. Um, so I'm going to stop soon. I'll say that when we look at this, there are two things that leap out as potential solutions, which I think we'll talk about today. The first is uh, security standards for telecommunications equipment. The Europeans like this. Their excuse is, or pardon me, their uh, explanation is, that was a slip. Um, <laughs> their, their explanation is, we don't want to name Huawei. We don't want to say Huawei. We don't want to say China. China is Germany's largest trade partner. But they're happy to write standards that say only buy from trusted sources, only buy from sources where the software can be shown to be relatively secure. So one of the debates is, can we come up with these standards? You saw in Prague the administration coming up with an initial set of principles that lay some of this out. So standards are part of our solution here. The other part, as you heard from the commissioner, is investment. Um, you can't fix this problem without spending money. And one of the advantages that Chinese have is they're willing to spend money Money. You might have seen they recently won uh, two contracts in Europe, uh, one in the Netherlands, one in Italy. Um, I know from some of the competitors, Huawei was able to find out the bid from the European competitor in the Netherlands, and they offered a 30% discount. Um, where did that money come from? Mm, let me think about that. Why did the Chinese government agree to spend, uh, undercut uh, the European competitor by 30%? It's not because they admired Dutch cuisine. Right. So we have a well-funded, nimble opponent, and Huawei is one of the tools they use. It poses real security risks for the U.S. and its allies. And so this is a great workshop. Uh, we definitely need to move out on this. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Professor Jonathan Mayer. Thanks. Good morning. Um, all right. Hopefully this will work. Excellent. Uh, so my hope is to briefly uh, provide a computer science perspective on the security risks associated uh, with uh, supply chain dependencies in communications networks. Um, the notion of a, uh, a, a supply chain risk isn't new. It's been around for millennia. Um, it uh, gained prominence in modern computing in the 1980s. Um, hopefully, the, there we go. Uh, uh, in the 1980s with a, uh, a lecture um, for the highest prize in computer science where uh, a luminary in the field pointed out that um, if you wanted to compromise a computer system, maybe instead of compromising the software directly, you could compromise the compiler used to build the software for that computer system. Um, and uh, those types of uh, attacks on dependencies in computer systems would be particularly difficult to detect. Uh, they could self-replicate. So in his example, the idea was, what if you compromise the compiler? And when it built another compiler, that would introduce new security risks. Um, and then, um, uh, 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 perhaps uh, most fundamentally, the problem becomes turtles all the way down. Right? So you may trust the uh, software, um, but you might not trust the compiler that was used to build the software. Uh, you might not trust the operating system. You might not trust the, the CPU or the memory or the, the hard disk that are behind that system. Um, and so ultimately, you have uh, a set of dependencies associated with uh, trust in modern computing, um, and you have to address those um, from a security perspective. Okay. So there are uh, three topics I want to briefly move through. Uh, first, um, uh, how uh, uh, supply chain risks might affect IP networks. Here I'm talking about broadband providers and core internet uh, networks. Um, second, uh, the uh, effects uh, for telecom networks. Here I'm talking about networks provisioning telephony. I'm going to focus on wireless service, though uh, a traditional uh, phone service, of course, could also be affected. Uh, and then last, I want to talk about some future directions, both in the near term and in the longer term, for mitigating these types of risks. 
Uh, so let me start with uh, 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 an important uh, uh, caution that I'm going to give a high-level discussion uh, of uh, what the supply chain risks might look like for IP networks and for telecom networks. Um, the actual risks uh, for those in the room are going to be very context-specific, right? So depending on how your network is architected, you may or may not have these particular risks. Uh, you may or may not have uh, mitigations in place. Uh, the magnitude of the risks may differ. Um, and ultimately, there is just no substitute for inventorying your own network and uh, uh, assessing the discrete risks opposed by the uh, posed by the equipment on the network. Uh, okay, so uh, starting with IP networks, um, a taxonomy that it might be helpful to keep in mind um, uh, uh, in going through it today uh, is uh, you might have risks to user devices, right? So you might have uh, smartphones, tablets, smartphones, desktops, laptops that are compromised uh, uh, associated with supply chain risk. Uh, you might have uh, uh, equipment on the local area network that's compromised. Uh, so for the firms in the room, that might be uh, the uh, office networking equipment or uh, corporate campus networking equipment. Uh, if you provision network out to customers, you might have customer premises equipment that could be at risk. Um, then there's the, the wide area network, the public internet. So if you're in the business of internet routing, um, whether that's at, the, at the, the very core of the internet itself or potentially you have some equipment placed out a little closer to customers, um, that in turn could pose some supply chain risks. Um, and then last, uh, 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 for many folks in the room, they're going to have some data center capability. Either they run their own data center or they're co-located in another data center. Um, that's going to be providing some, uh, 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 I guess these days we call them cloud services, um, uh, some database services perhaps could even be in the business of providing uh, uh, computer uh, security uh, services and that could in turn um, be uh, a source of supply chain risk. Um, and so it's important to think through what particular type of equipment is posing the risk and then what the exact risk is. Um, so here's a way you might think about it from a computer security perspective that uh, you've got uh, specific uh, types of equipment, specific risks, and then assess them individually. So for example, a user device compromise, and I, I apologize because of the closed captioning, we're a little cut off here, um, may pose um, a limited denial of service risk, for example. Um, you might have one person's smartphone uh, stop working. Um, I put the, the little pie charts in, uh, uh, in red. Usually you want it to be full, like that's a good thing. In this case, that's a bad thing. Uh, so uh, a user device compromise right, may pose a limited uh, risk of denial of service. Perhaps you might not be overly concerned about degraded service, but you might be really concerned about stealing an individual user's data or tampering with an individual user's data. Um, over on compromise to the network, um, you might be particularly concerned about uh, denying access to IP communications uh, to a particular office or perhaps to a entire geographic region. Um, you might be less concerned about access to data or tampering with data um, because uh, uh, increasingly IP communications are encrypted and that's going to provide a level of defense against an untrusted network. Um, and then over on issues in your data center, you know, you might have some concerns about resiliency depending on how your network is architected. Uh, architected you might be especially concerned about data access or modification because oftentimes that's where your business logic and, and data store is going to be. Um, so that's the level of precision I hope that folks will uh, get into uh, throughout today and a taxonomy that you may find helpful. Um, okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to say about IP networks. Now let me switch over to telecom networks. Uh, again, I'm going to focus on wireless telephony, um, but uh, the, the same sort of assessment would apply to, to traditional telephony. Um, so again, you've got user devices that might be at risk from supply chain compromise. Um, then you've got your base stations. Um, uh, so you've got everything from the antenna all the way down to the uh, equipment used to uh, get you onto the network backhaul. Um, and then you've got your core network. Um, and unlike uh, IP networking, there's uh, tends to be much more logical pushed into the core network in telecom networks. Um, and so uh, there in particular, there could be um, uh, uh, an awful lot of uh, a risk around um, uh, a supply chain compromise. So again, I want to try to break down um, the, that grid of what happens I I with a particular piece of equipment, a particular class of risk. So the user device compromise category may look pretty similar between a, a telecom network and an IP network. A base station compromise, by contrast, might look a little different. Uh, so you might weight the uh, 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 service resiliency risk more or less depending on, um, for instance, uh, other providers in the area, how dependent folks are in the area on your uh, telephony service. Um, you might be more concerned about access to data or tampering with data in the event of a base station compromise um, because uh, telephony networks provide access to the underlying data. By contrast, in an IP network, as I mentioned, you might have, um, uh, uh, you might have encryption that, provide, uh, that can uh, limit that kind of access. And then over in the case of a core network compromise, uh, 
um, you might be more concerned about it because of the uh, uh, reliance on these types of services for emergency services, for example, um, uh, uh, and the, in some areas, potentially lack of uh, a replacement service. I want to emphasize again, this is sort of a way of thinking about it, and I'm trying to talk through some of the factors you might think through, but how this applies to your particular network, again, is going to be very context specific. So I want to draw out a, a couple of key points uh, about um, uh, uh, the comparison uh, between uh, IP networks and telephony networks. Um, one is, as I mentioned, encryption can provide a layer of protection on IP networks that is not going to be present in general on telephony networks. Um, right? So uh, if you've used um, uh, uh, a secure website, I imagine everyone in the room has, right, where the little green lock icon appears in your web browser. Right? If a Huawei router or any other vendor's router is sitting between you and that web service, um, and uh, it gets compromised, whether um, uh, uh, because of a uh, supply chain uh, 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 risk where the vendor was um, malicious in some way, or through software bug, any reason, um, you still have a layer of protection. Right? The whole point of having that encrypted and authenticated connection to the web service is that you don't have to trust the network. Um, worst case scenario, your traffic doesn't get to the web service, but uh, 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 an untrusted network element isn't going to be able to read that traffic, isn't going to be able to tamper with that traffic. So that's an important difference. Uh, another important difference is IP routing may be more resilient than telecom routing. That's going to, again, depend on the context. Um, IP routing is built by design to be somewhat resilient to failures in the network. Um, but when network elements fail in ways that are uh, malicious, that, that resiliency may not kick in. Um, both IP routing and telephony routing place trust in other service providers, right? So in the uh, uh, IP context, you trust other providers to honestly tell you what the routes are on the public internet. Um, uh, there have been instances where routes have been announced that uh, are not uh, trustworthy. Um, and then uh, similarly over in the uh, uh, telephony space, SS7 diameter uh, can pose uh, risks. They depend on um, uh, other services. So just because you get the supply chain security issue right doesn't mean that the services that you trust get the supply chain issue right. Um, and you may also be outsourcing some of your business functions uh, to services that may not get that issue right. Um, and in particular, routing in the telephony context is increasingly outsourced. And so there may be an issue there. Um, uh, another point I want to make sure to draw out is that assessing security in telephony networks tends to be a lot harder than assessing security in IP networks. Um, it's uh, more of a niche field. The pool of uh, uh, qualified personnel to look at those security risks is more limited. The tools available for assessing those risks tend to be less mature. The standards for those risks, addressing those risks, tend to be less mature. Um, and so that poses a set of challenges um, that is a, perhaps a degree higher than IP networks. Uh, and then the last point I want to make uh, is that um, mitigating supply chain risks that pose availability and performance issues can be somewhat more straightforward than mitigating issues of data access and tampering. Um, uh, and, th and the reason is, ultimately, those can boil down to risks of network resilience. Um, they're not, uh, that's uh, not ne exactly the case because you might have a, a malicious actor here. But um, uh, uh, ultimately, um, if you are protecting your network against a failed network element, regardless of whether it's malicious, that's going to give you protection against a supply chain attack uh, that involves uh, degrading network availability or performance. Okay, so those are some of the considerations I wanted to make sure to tease out um, uh, about IP networks and telecom networks. Um, last, um, uh, I want to talk about some future directions for addressing these issues in the near term and in the longer term. Um, in the near term, um, I think uh, unambiguously, it, uh, from a computer science perspective, uh, it is a best practice to maintain an up-to-date inventory of the equipment on your network. Um, I, I understand that uh, some folks in the room are in the process of accomplishing that inventory uh, now, and I applaud them for it. Um, uh, uh, as the commissioner put it, find it. Um, uh, next up, uh, from a computer science perspective, um, again, you're going to have to do this context-specific analysis of um, what are the specific pieces of equipment posing specific risks, how specifically can you mitigate them, um, and that's going to depend on a lot of expertise. I look forward to hearing about it today, um, or as the commissioner put it, fix it. Um, uh, and then last, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are risks to network availability and performance in addition to risks associated with data theft and tampering, so make sure to consider those two in the course of the finding it and fixing it. Uh, as for uh, long-term steps, 
Um, I think it's important to consider moving away from the so-called perimeter security model in telecom networks. So for a number of years in, uh, in IP networks, uh, somewhat less so now, and certainly still the case in telecom networks, there's a strong tradition of trying to build a perimeter around your network, keeping the bad guys out and the good guys in. And the idea is we trust the stuff on the inside and we don't trust the stuff on the outside. Um, that does not work so well these days. Uh, it does not work so well in part because of supply chain risks, but there are many other kinds of risks. There are software bugs. There are vendors that go out of business. There are all sorts of reasons that the equipment on your network might not be trustworthy. So it's important to protect yourself from the stuff on the inside in addition to from the stuff on the outside. Uh, the second thing I would encourage is a long-term shift in the te uh, telecom field, um, is moving away from the trusted network model for telephony services. So as I mentioned, IP networking uh, has the capability to layer encryption, which uh, secures your, your communications, on top of uh, the network communications itself. By contrast, telephony tends to rely on inherently trusting the network. Um, one of the trade-offs for that is if there's a compromise in the network uh, in IP, that can lim that, that can uh, be limited to uh, uh, performance and availability issues. In telephony, you're looking at access to content and tampering with content issues too. Um, uh, the third point I want to suggest for a long-term direction um, is transitioning the best practices in IP network security over to the telephony space. Um, it is uh, no secret that the telephony space has tended to lag somewhat behind the IP space in adopting best practices, whether that's uh, routinely auditing systems, auditing suppliers, um, uh, uh, establishing standards through transparent processes, making sure they're well vetted. Um, uh, and so uh, it's very important to uh, try to get um, what we've learned over the intervening decades from the IP space over to the telephony space. Uh, so those, I think, are some long-term uh, 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 trajectories that are worth keeping in mind in addition to the finding it and fixing it, and the funding it, which computer science has no perspective on whatsoever. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Mayer. Uh, we have uh, an ambitious schedule today, so I'd like to invite the panelists for the first panel to uh, uh, come forward and take a seat. Um, and uh, I uh, will make just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, this event is uh, being streamed on the internet, uh, and if you're watching on the internet, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your interest. You can email questions to livequestions at fcc.gov. They will come to Commissioner Stark's staff. Uh, and if you're here with us and you have questions, um, you can give them to us by writing them on a card. Who, who has the cards? Um, in, the, in either corner of the room. Um, and uh, for, um, for, for panelists, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on the time um, to uh, try and keep us on track, and I'll give you a little, a little signal if we uh, approach or exceed the five minutes that we're looking for. Um, also, uh, as they always are, the Commission's ex parte rules are in effect, so to the extent that there are presentations made to uh, decision makers, um, uh, those uh, will, will trigger ex parte rules and require filings. But with that, let me introduce the first panel. Um, we are delighted to have uh, Brian Hendricks from Nokia. Uh, Jim Lewis has agreed to pull double duty and is back with us on the first panel. Um, John Nettles from the Pine Belt Telephone Company in Georgia. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, from the Pine Belt Telephone Company in Alabama. And Mike Saperstein from US Telecom. Uh, so let's begin. Um, and maybe we will, uh, Mike, start with you and work our way up the panel. Uh, and. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Randy. Thank you, Commissioner Starks, for inviting me to be here today to share a wireline perspective on supply chain threats. Uh, U.S. Telecom, the Broadband Association, represents a diverse membership ranging from large publicly traded companies to small cooperatives and uh, rural companies. All of our members are committed to the security of the digital ecosystem because it drives innovation, economic growth, public safety, and our national security. Our members are on the front lines of providing connectivity to the nation, and we take seriously any threat to the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of our network operations. Therefore, we're actively involved with a number of current supply chain work streams designed to examine the threats to all three of those components. 
You know, securing the supply chain is particularly vital in light of the shift to 5G, which will produce much more data and drive much more operations than the world has ever seen. While most people think of 5G as a wireless play, um, 5G networks will be far more dependent on wired fiber than any technology ever before. As my CEO, Jonathan Spalter, frequently says, 5G is wired wireless. As we've already heard um, from our Jim over here, that um, there is a significant risk that nation states can exploit the technology supply chain in ways that threaten our global internet and communications ecosystem. You know, we support federal risk management activities to identify supply chain risks and devise appropriate remedial measures, but it's important that federal supply chain risk management policy is carefully calibrated under a whole of government approach that Commissioner Starks mentioned, uh, informed by the intelligence community and taking taking into account important trade and policy considerations. So that's why we're particularly proud of our involvement with the ICT Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force, which DHS is operating out of its National Risk Management Center. At US Telecom, we've had a unique vantage point on this and supply chain issues. As Robert Mayer, who's our senior vice president that many of you may know for cybersecurity, um, he serves as both the chair of the Comm Sector Coordinating Council as well as the co-chair of the ICT Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force. Uh, Robert is currently out at Cyber Week in Israel speaking on many of these same topics. So this is truly a global issue that we're exploring here today. You know, the task force has become ground zero for federal supply chain activities and is perhaps the biggest proof of concept that we've ever attempted of the public-private partnership model. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the task force is the only formally chartered industry-government partnership that is led and composed in a two-to-one industry-to-government ratio. This demonstrates industry's commitment to doing our part and working arm-in-arm -arm with government to protect our nation's critical infrastructure. In total, the task force is comp uh, comprised of 20 federal entities, including the FCC, Commerce, DHS, DOJ, NIST, as well as 40 leaders of global and communications IT sectors. Uh, the task force started by assembling an inventory of existing supply chain risk management efforts across the industry and subsequently launched four main work streams. And one of our co-chairs, I see Drew Morin out there today. Thank you for your work on this, Drew. But the uh, work streams are working group one is information sharing, uh, developing a common framework for the bi-directional sharing of supply chain risk information between government and industry. Working group two is threat evaluation. How do we identify processes and criteria for threat-based evaluation of ICT supplies, products, and services? Uh, working group three is identification of market segments and evaluation for a qualified bidder and manufacturer list, and I see Savannah Schaefer out there, who is also co-chairing that effort. Uh, and working group four is producing policy recommendations to incent the purchase of original manufacturers and authorized resellers. Uh, you know, these groups have been meeting regularly and developing innovative approaches to meet the challenges at hand, and we're very pleased that the FCC has been fully engaged on this and has representatives on all four of these work streams. The task force has already approved the recommendations of working group four, which covers the, um, the original authorized equipment, and we're looking forward to <coughs> following the other recommendations later this summer. At the same time, commerce, DHS, industry, and other partners are already working to implement the president's executive order. We will not know the effect of the EO's prohibitions until the Department of Commerce issues its implementing uh, rules or otherwise takes action under the EO, but this is a large area of focus for us. So throughout the risk management analysis, we are committed to considering the security of the whole ecosystem. What information is critical? What are the threats? What is the likelihood of attack? And what are the potential consequences? And any resultant action should be carefully tailored to avoid or minimize negative impact on US companies. So with that, I will turn it over to my panelists. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and look forward to the discussion. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to share a little bit about my company. Um, I was introduced as the president of, of Pine Belt Telephone Company, which is true. Um, but I'm also the president of Pine Belt Cellular, which is our uh, um, wireless affiliate. Um, Pine Belt is a family-owned and operated company. With We've got deep roots in the Black Belt region of Alabama. Uh, we were initially established in 1958 as a, a landline operator serving four uh, local rural communities in that area. Over the past 60 years, we've managed to grow the company into what I like to say is a state-of-the-art landline and wireless carrier. 
We provide voice, video, and data services at fair and uh, reasonable rates to various part, parts of a six county region uh, with a population of just over 100,000. As a rural operator serving very low densities, pretty much since day one, we've had to look outside of our internal revenue streams to fund our build out projects. For our wireline network, the primary source of that investment capital has come from a series of loans from the Rural Utility Service, uh, the first of which we obtained in 1960. Most recently, we secured a, a, a RUS loan to completely rebuild our ILEC wireline footprint with fiber. Um, and it's largely been our uh, reliance on the ongoing USF cost, uh, high cost receipts as well as inter intercarrier compensation revenues in the intervening years that's allowed us to uh, execute those plans with a certain amount of uh, predictability and prepare for uh, future wireline investments. Um, these loans and subsidies, however, have only gone so far in helping us to serve our customers in that they were targeted at making and maintaining investments in wireline networks, not wireless, and on the wireline side, even uh, pretty much uh, limited to voice uh, only. On the wireless side, we've had to uh, scrounge for the funds needed to build and improve those services, um, services uh, which have become staple in today's life, you know, no matter whether you live in a rural area or in, in an urban community. For example, in the 1990s, we executed at least three asset sales uh, to fund our initial analog build out and then soon thereafter the conversion from anal analog to digital. In 2010, we engaged in a tower sale and a leaseback transaction to uh, supplement uh, what were some pretty significantly diminishing wireless cash flows and to basically stay afloat. Um, nearly all of the cash from these deals uh, was invested back in the, in the business as well as the community. Um, we were truly blessed when the commission rolled out the Mobility Fund Phase 1 program. Um, and with the help of this one-time USF allocation for wireless, we were able to finally make the upgrades required to offer mobile data services everywhere in our footprint. Uh, prior to receiving these allocations, we were operating on a 2G Lucent network originally installed in 1999 um, that was long past its manufacturer's supported life, uh, augmented uh, a little bit by a very small 3G footprint that was uh, built using some equipment uh, from a niche vendor, which uh, is, no, is not around anymore. Um, and without this uh, one-time shot in the arm, most assuredly we would have had to have exited the wireless business. Uh, and like many other rural carriers that received MF1 uh, support, we sought to stretch these funds as far as we could in order to provide the highest quality service to as much of the population as possible. <coughs> Um, by choosing ZTE, which is, which is our, our vendor, um, um, we, not only were we able to easily meet our 3G build-out requirements, but we also realized a significant uptick in recurring revenues, which set the stage for us to quickly deploy 4G and, and uh, Volte, uh, 4G LTE and Volte. At the, at the time of uh, our receiving the MF1 support, um, choosing ZTE was basically a no-brainer. We solicited quotes from five different vendors, and ZTE was almost one-third of the highest vendor and 25% below, uh, below the second lowest bidder. And so without uh, anything to tell us to do otherwise, we chose them. Uh, we turned up the first components of the new network in 2014, uh, completed our build-out obligations in 2015, and I thought the view over the horizon was pretty bright. Then um, uh, early last year, as the supply chain and cybersecurity concerns uh, began to come into the public debate, a uh, 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 low and dark cloud of uncertainty has, has settled over our head, and it, it stays there to this day. And um, it, you, could, you could even say that, that it, um, our wireless consumers could be facing some, you know, some gloomy times as well especially if we have to shut down the ZTE network uh, for a preferred vendor in, um, in order to meet those security concerns with, without significant third-party assistance. Uh, furthermore, given the recent actions by the FCC, Congress, and the White House, we currently can't say with much confidence at all when, how, or even if we'll be able to improve and expand our coverage into the numerous underserved population areas uh, throughout West Central Alabama. Um, something that we won't expect to be able to do, or certainly hope to be able to do, using the 600 megahertz licenses that we purchased at, at auction last year. Uh, and don't even ask me about 5G at this point until we get some of these other questions answered. Uh, we understand that we're not the only carrier facing these uncertainties, and, behind, and on behalf of Pine Belt, I sincerely thank you, Commissioner Starks, for convening this workshop. 
Uh, to say the least, I truly hope we can all remain uh, actively engaged uh, on this subject after today, that we soon define what equipment must be replaced, what equipment can remain if monitored, and that we discuss and define a reasonable time frame within which we will be required uh, to make any mandated replacements or, or, replacements or install intrusion uh, monitoring systems. I also hope we use today's time to specifically discuss the status of equipment um, that was purchased with commission funds, purchases that were made long before any ban on such equipment was publicly discussed, and whether carriers who purchased equipment prior to the ban will, will receive funding to assist with replacement. Uh, Pine Belt, like many other carriers, originally purchased and deployed this equipment to meet the then-defined uh, policy objective of extending 3G or better mobile voice and data into unserved communities. And so now, uh, with, if the uh, government wishes to establish uh, new and different uh, but equally important policy objectives, it, it is certainly reasonable for carriers like us to receive similar government assistance in, in meeting these new goals, and without which numerous and, and rural and urban customers will suffer, including those requiring public safety. Um, so again, thank you very much, and I appreciate being here. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, Starks for, for inviting Nokia to participate here uh, today and for having this important discussion. I should say at the top, I think it's probably fairly obvious to most people it's a bit of a tricky situation for us to be talking about, I think, uh, as a significant player in the equipment ecosystem uh, with more than a passing interest in these conversations. But we think it's really important to bring our technical expertise to the table uh, in any event. And so we're starting from a place in our comments, not whether you should or shouldn't trust any particular supplier, but um, what happens if you don't and, and what options that you might have for, for mitigation. Uh, and that's probably the right place, <clears throat> excuse me, to start is that there is a major distinction between trusting your equipment and trusting your supplier. Ideally, you would do both. Um, there are reasons at times you might not trust the equipment from any supplier. Mistakes happen. There are things we don't anticipate when we're designing equipment. Uh, I often use an example in, in 4G where through the standards uh, we made some choices about preserving radio resources versus security and it'll, it permitted some things like MC catching to happen. Those things occur. You don't always see over the horizon. But when you trust your supplier, you trust that those vulnerabilities are not there purposefully and that when they are identified they will be remediated. If you don't trust your supplier, um, whether it's because they have uh, interest in or uh, requirements to facilitate access, your mitigation toolkit gets much smaller in terms of what you can do to contain that threat. Um, I would also say uh, that we have been consulted by a lot of policymakers, and our message to them is basically you do have to start from a foundation of trust. Uh, as George Michael saying, you've got to have faith, faith, faith. If you don't have that faith, uh, your toolkit gets, as I mentioned, extremely limited. We've seen in Europe uh, recently so the focus, as, as Jim mentioned, on concepts like network segregation. Think of this as, well, that supplier maybe has risks. We won't let them in the core. Uh, but but it, they're okay in the radio layer. And our argument there has basically been, we think this fundamentally misunderstands both the architecture of LTE networks, but certainly the early indications for what 5G will be with a much more distributed core, uh, a lot more value and a much greater attack surface in the radio layer. <clears throat> excuse me, where you'll have many billions of new devices added, IoT devices often coming from companies that have no heritage as device makers, where you can trust to some degree what handset makers have been doing to incorporate security. You're going to have many cheap, inexpensive IoT devices. Our threat detection and mitigation center in Ottawa has millions of sensors embedded across the world uh, with carrier networks taking a look at threats that we share with the carriers. And what we are finding is that IoT devices attached to a network are corrupted within moments, literally two or three minutes of being identified for the first time on a network. When you multiply the number of devices expected to be in the radio layer for 5G, that becomes an enormous attack service. The radio layer becomes a much more valuable attack plane from the perspective of <clears throat> an attacker than it has been in any previous generation of technology. So 
When you add to that, that typically, and the professor spoke a little bit uh, about this, we don't encrypt everywhere in a network. Typically, you're encrypting between the radio layer and the user device, but not necessarily anywhere else uh, in the network. That, of course, can, can uh, be approached differently. But you have to bear in mind that the radio supplier is in a key position to facilitate access with the encryption keys. So if you don't trust the radio supplier, you're going to have a serious concern about allowing that supplier to be uh, your, your radio <coughs> excuse me, supplier. Also, 4-5G, our, our vision of it anyway, is that a lot of traffic isn't going to pass through a core necessarily. And so having a trusted supplier in the core will have an even more limited ability to mitigate risk that is introduced at the radio layer. So this really does become, uh, in some cases, a house of cards, where if you don't start with the fundamental ability to trust what's been deployed and who is deploying it, you have limitations. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, this is one I'll confess we, we don't really understand, uh, is the discussion about geographic segregation. Think about this as we're concerned about a supplier being deployed in London, near pairing points for critical infrastructure, but the suburbs are okay. Uh, that is not how traffic moves through networks, and, and it ignores the interconnection and the fact that you can introduce vulnerabilities in many different places. So we don't really see, again, if you start from the premise of not being able to trust the supplier of the infrastructure, that that's a, an effective mitigation. So that leaves a couple of other options, one of which the British have deployed, which is a post-development testing and certification system. I think the best thing that we can say about this is there is value, particularly in detecting quality problems. Uh, but when you look very closely at the reports, and this is not to cast aspersions at what the British have done, but it is to, to, to contextualize, one supplier looked at for multiple years at great expense, identified major quality problems that haven't been remediated, and for most categories of products, have not been able to pass through the multiple phases of testing for which the center was designed, including linking to things which were deployed in a network to verify that they were actually uh, what was tested in a lab situation. When you think about 5G as a software-driven platform, we will be doing updates to the software weekly for sure, perhaps nightly in some cases, and certainly with respect to vulnerabilities that are found much more rapidly than that. We are not confident that there are sufficient resources or expertise to be able to review all of that in real time prior to deployment. So it's not that that is not a mitigation tool at all, but it has a limited scope, a limited value, and a limited purpose. Also comes at great expense. Uh, so we have to be realistic about that, which leaves you with <coughs> the options of mitigating the risk by removing untrustworthy suppliers from the supply ecosystem. Again, we're not telling you you should or you shouldn't for obvious reasons, but if you reach that conclusion, which seems to be the conclusion of the United States government and several others, then remediation through removal is very likely your only uh, a reasonable tool. Now, I would say we believe, and we have said publicly, I'll say it again here, uh, that this is a, an issue that will, will fall particularly hard on small carriers in the United States, uh, some of whom we serve, some of whom we do not. Um, but we have committed that we will support finding financing for this. We think it is essential to do that. Uh, I also have said that I think counting on Congress to deliver that is probably not a, a truly sound strategy, so I think we should certainly pursue that. Nokia will lobby to that effect, but we should also think about plan Bs uh, and Cs, perhaps, about where we might find funding for that. And to all the small carriers, I would say, for those of you, of you who have not dealt with us uh, in the past, uh, it's probably time to re-engage. We've taken a lot of internal looks at what we might be able to do on pricing and, and structure because we realize this is a problem and you know, we're, we're committed to trying to help solve it. So uh, happy to talk about any of those points in, in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you. As if you haven't heard enough from me, uh, it's hard to follow these guys because they've really hit some of the key points. And so uh, John, uh, Mike, and Brian, uh, I'll repeat a little bit of what they said because I am too lazy to change my remarks. But um, <laughs> So one, I'm trying to frame this in a larger perspective. And one way to think about it is intelligence organizations are opportunistic and they're well-resourced. So if you 
leave open a door, there's a chance that they'll go through it. And we've seen this movie, certainly in the telecom space and the internet space, uh, repeatedly for the last couple, the last several decades, right? Um, China collects against U.S. military facilities. I was talking to a long-term CIA employee uh, two days ago who said they thought it was funny that when they have a building that it's known that a Chinese company would buy, uh, buy a nearby building and somehow all the, all the antennas and dishes would be pointing at their building. So, and we've seen other examples of um, interest in U.S. military testing facilities uh, which are usually located in remote areas, U.S. military bases, particularly missile bases in the in the north, uh, Redstone uh, <coughs> Arsenal, uh, always a good target. So we've got a we've got an issue here. They we know they do this. We know they're opportunistic, and 5G creates opportunities. Um, let's talk about the U.K. solution. And Brian talked about it a lot. And it's they're they're sort of holding out to say this is what they're going to do. But I note that the Dutch, the French. Uh, probably the Israelis and perhaps the Germans will do something similar uh, if they think uh, we won't scream too much. Um, it's a partial ban, right? And it does talk about segregating uh, sensitive areas. And so the British told me Whitehall, which is sort of their equivalent of downtown DC or the Pentagon, um, they would not allow Huawei into any parts of the network there. Uh, but they would allow it, as, as Brian said, in other parts. And so there's this question, um, can I keep you away from sensitive areas? And then that allows me to, allows me to mitigate risk. Um, you have this uh, question of edge versus core, which Brian also raised. And the theory there is um, it's increasingly tattered, but the argument is that um, I can let you into the, the radio access network, <coughs> but not into the core network, and that will give me uh, degree of protection. And to be fair to the other folks who are advocating this, none of them say it eliminates risk. They say it makes risk manageable, right? So they're only saying the only way to eliminate risk, I think you'd hear this, is by banning the equipment entirely. Um, but the argument is, well, if I do these geographic segregations and the architectural solution of core versus edge, that that makes the risk uh, manageable and acceptable. Um, that's one of the debate points we're talking about now. Now, to some of the things John said, using Chinese equipment made perfect sense uh, even five years ago, uh, certainly 10 years ago, right? And we had a happier vision of what our relationship was, with China was going to be like. We were going to be partners. We built, we have this huge supply chain problem, which is so integrated. And so when people talk about decoupling, it's like, holy cow, where do you start, right? Um, when you look at Chinese telecom equipment, it depends entirely on advanced U.S. technology. That's part of why Huawei has, the Chinese have put Huawei on the table in the trade talks, because Huawei has about a year left. They stockpiled, they knew this was coming. Um, and when their stockpiles of things from big American tech companies run out, they can't make their equipment anymore. At the same time, if you look at those big American tech companies, their stuff all has Chinese components in it. Admittedly, it's low, but <coughs> lower level, not sensitive, but it made, it made economic sense. Everything we did made economic sense before China was a competitor, before China was a potential opponent. And every week it looks like it becomes a little more potential than the week before. So no one should say, oh, why did you do this? It was a mistake. It made perfect sense five or 10 years ago. And in a happier world, it would still make sense, but that's not the case now. Um, the issue is, um, can we use some Chinese equipment, or can we tolerate some Chinese equipment, or do we have to rip it out? And the rip out issue is largely one of, uh, of cost, right? Can we afford to rip out all Chinese equipment? And it would be very expensive, as we've heard. Um, is there a way, as we move forward, to manage this? I think, as you've heard, people are looking at certification and standards. The British experience is kind of funny. One thing that may not be as well known is that the, the board that reproduced the report, part of the agreement was Huawei had to be on that board. So the report you're seeing is what Huawei would clear, right? Uh, and the Brits told me offline that it took many months to work out what the text would say, <laughs> and it perhaps wasn't as hard hitting as they might have said if it had, had it only been GCHQ or NCSA doing the report. Um, but the issue there is, 
can we come up with standards? Can we come up with some sort of certification process that would give us a baseline to say this equipment can be trusted, this equipment can't? It's really a question of risk tolerance, right? And a balance between how much risk you're willing to take and how much you're willing to spend. A lot of the European countries say we need to buy Huawei because that if we don't, that will delay our entry into 4G, uh, 5G, moving from 4G to 5G. Um, there's clear price advantages, um, but we know we're accepting some risk. So people are looking for ways to manage this risk, right? I will say there's some discussion in the Congress. I'm a tiny bit more optimistic. This is, I can't believe I'm saying this. A tiny bit more optimistic that Congress may see its way to provide uh, some funding for this. Um, I probably wouldn't bet a lot on that, but I don't think you can rule it out. So we have this problem here of uh, how do you build trust? Um, where's the risk now? And how do we mitigate that risk at a cost that's acceptable to the nation, right? And that does not harm the smaller carriers, many of whom made the right economic decision and the right political decision five or 10 years ago. We're in a different situation, so how do we move forward? And I'll stop there. Can I, can I just make one point, because <clears throat> it's important, um, not, not least of which reason to not anger my friends in Congress, but uh, I, I worked there for a while, and so <laughs> my reason for lack of optimism <clears throat> was just that's the way things are. I mean, I think everybody fundamentally understands the issue. I think what we want to make sure of is two things that, that I shared with uh, Commissioner Starks the other day. Um, one, the funding is sufficient. So we have to identify the scope of what it is you're looking to remediate, right? And there are private ways that you can do that, <coughs> you know, sort of protected self-disclosure, whatever it is. But you have to get an answer for how big the pot is, because I think getting through the fun house once will be hard. Getting through it twice is, is pretty unlikely. Uh, so we have to make sure there's sufficient funding. The second thing is, I think it's really important to address this question about remediation causes delays. We do swaps all the time, right? We've done something like five or six dozen swaps uh, of very large scale, including the largest ever done when we acquired Alcatel-Lucent and swapped out every base station for both AT&T and Verizon with no service disruption. This is not something <clears throat> that, that is difficult logistically. It takes time. It takes coordination. Um, we don't disrupt service. But I think what's really important, besides the money, is to make sure we don't constrain what can be bought with the money. Uh, to the maximum extent possible, particularly for smaller carriers, we should not be suggesting they have to buy like for like. The opportunity exists to buy flexible equipment that is 5G uh, capable. You know, we have solutions, other vendors have solutions that do both LTE and are 5G ready. That's what we should be making sure uh, happens because that's going to make it a little bit easier to to avoid this problem of so you remediated the problem but now you still have to do a 5g build on top of it so we want to keep those things in mind yeah i'll give you one data point real quick which is we had a dinner where we had um intel's vp who oversees their whole 5g uh product line talk about you know what could be done in the standards process and all that we had senators and House members from both sides of the aisle. And at the end of the dinner, one of the senators said, maybe we should think about funding some of this stuff. Maybe we can put it into either an FCC bill or an infrastructure bill. And I thought, well, there goes the, they lit the fuse. Let's wait for the explosion. And to my shock, the senators and the members from the other side of the aisle said, that's a good idea. This is a big enough, big enough problem that we need to find a bipartisan solution. So that's why I'm willing to make a tiny bet. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get started um, on a couple of questions here. Um, first one here for, for all the folks on the panel. I, I think a lot of us that are in policy making um, spheres are, are really trying to get our heads around what is the scope. Uh, the scope of this problem, and that has many different vectors, but I'll, I'll, I'll start in one, which is, you know, how can we figure out who has this equipment? Um, is it, all of these are under finite, fixed, and funded, they're all kind of uh, blended together. Uh, you know, is it simply that we're going to have to come up with uh, some type of a funding mechanism where we're going to incentivize people to raise their hands that may have it? which is, again, why I emphasize your leadership, John, uh, in raising your hand and, and, and coming forward and, and, and the courageous step that you've made there. You know, but how can we start to figure out how to actually find this at the most fundamental level? 
I'll, I'll take a swing at that. Just a short one, though. Um, why not ask ZTE and Huawei if they're the ones who are interested in you who all they've sold to? I, I mean, I presume you know, the commission would have the authority to do that at some level. Um, you know, that, that might be one. That might be one. You know, it might be an oversimplified approach to it, but you know, it might be a way place to start. Yeah. So, you know, I can't speak for uh, individual companies. I can certainly tell you that it seems to be a much more pervasive problem in rural America. I think there was a f uh, front page article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago talking about some rural wireless carriers and the challenges they faced. I know I've talked to some of uh, U.S. Telecom's members, and they have seen the difference between the Huawei equipment and the other brands be a difference of four to five times. And so people in are having costs in terms of costs. Mm -hmm. And you know, <coughs> when you're talking about rural America, cost is right at the top of the list mm -hmm. because the economics are simply, as you know, John, are simply extremely challenging and every dollar matters and the efficiencies of what you can do with, us, with those dollars is the difference between serving and not serving a substantial part of the community. So I, I think we're right to think that it's a uh, to be looking at rural America in terms of what you can do to get companies to stand up and say hey I've got this problem I think we need to come up with a more clear path forward I think right now there's a lot of uncertainty like what does this mean for my company does it mean that I'm going to be on the hook for you know replacing all of this does this mean I'm going to have to undertake uh, significant IT considerations because you know theoretically they didn't do anything wrong when in purchasing this and I think there's just a lot of uncertainty in having folks come forward at this juncture and the more clear we make our overall policy decisions the better off we'll be and the more we can have an open dialogue say okay this is the problem let's go about fixing it and in that regard, we, you know, I think it's been said, you know, we've got to define just exactly what it is we're looking for. <laughs> um, you know, is it the RAN that we're concerned with? Is it the core? Is it the backhaul network? Is it, you know, all, all three of those kind of broad components together? Yeah, and so, you know, to that, I, you know, that's kind of where I wanted to take things next is obviously, you know, these networks include uh, a whole different set of, uh, of equipment, um, you know, from wireless radio equipment to backhauls um, uh, and routers and switches and, and so to you Brian and obviously um, any of these questions can be answered by all if folks want to chip in they feel like they have something to say um, but can you help us think through you know does some of this equipment pose more of a threat uh, in your mind or how would you help us think through that well, the first thing I'd want to do is get you somebody much more intelligent than me to answer it <laughs> from a <clears throat> excuse me from a technical perspective. I think some would tell you everything from the core out to the user needs needs to come out, uh, but that's a lot. Uh, what we are prepared to say is what I talked about in my my comments. Uh, the core and the RAN are the key pieces of a network, and those are areas where vulnerabilities are, are fairly. Uh, easy to predict um, the damage that they can do and the place that you can get the greatest security dividend from making changes. We'd have to get back to you on backhaul and other pieces, which I'm happy to do. The one thing <clears throat> that, our, that our security engineers tell us all the time is it's very easy to insert vulnerabilities into infrastructure in many different places. And particularly because I think as the professor alluded to, uh, the way encryption is used in a telephone network versus other places. Um, you know, there are vulnerability, vulnerable <laughs> spots in many insertion points. So I think some security people would tell you, you need trust in all possible insertion points, uh, which is a very broad scope. It would likely include the backhaul. It would likely include other things as well. But for today's purposes, I'd say we're comfortable that Core and RAN represent the, the bulk <coughs> of what you need to look at. But we can come back to you on the rest. Yeah, um, Jim, tell me um, what kind of information you think is transmitted. Um, you know, what is the nature of the threat that you can um, um, share with us? Obviously, we're in a public setting. Sure. You know, some of us here have you know security um, clearances and whatnot. Um, but is there are there any types of communications that you would think would be otherwise excluded? Um, 
obviously a, a real concern that we had that we dealt with in the China Mobile matter that we voted on here at the FCC is could government communications flow through some of these? T tell us, you know, how you think about the various threats and risks out there. And, and there's a relationship to the larger debate on privacy, I should note, too, which is as everything becomes interconnected, uh, I was talking to a car manufacturer who said the, the future car would be able to talk to my refrigerator. I said, why does my car want to talk to my refrigerator? <laughs> but it will talk to my refrigerator. Uh, you've seen a number of examples. Uh, if you know about some of the fitness devices, well, that sounds fairly harmless, right? But it connects to the internet. And you can determine location, direction, movement from that. So we're seeing an era where there huge floods of data will be generated by these devices. They will connect over mobile networks largely. Uh, and they will provide you with the ability to um, say when people are moving, where they're moving, who's moving. Um, that's the risk. It's, it, sometimes it sounds silly. I mean, I, there's a debate now about should Washington buy metro cars from a Chinese company. Um, the issue that you uh, have to ask is it, the metro car itself is probably not going to be spying on you unless it connects back to China. So that's what we want to look at is the ability to send data to China and the ability of the Chinese to manipulate and analyze that data, which has increased exponentially. You're, you're all familiar with the OPM hack. That was one of a series. It included healthcare providers, uh, travel services, an airline, uh, some others. If you pile all that stuff together, and if any of you know how you know, marketing and advertising works, and probably most of you do, you can use that for intelligence purposes. So we need to ask not only where is the equipment located, but what the data is that people will be sending over it. And increasingly, it will be more and it will be useful. Is the threat for um, you know, disruption of communications, um, you know, obviously the most um, vulnerable we would be is if there were a national emergency of some type. Um, you know, as you as you talked about, our financial system, our transportation system, our healthcare system, all of this is is, is flowing over these communications lines, and so there's just a generalized um, uh, exposure there. But are there uh, other um, talk to us a little bit about the surveillance risk and threat, and and how you see that um, as a real concern. And I, you know, I keep saying China. So but that you live in Washington, you have to say China at least every third minute. Um, but China is the world's leader in developing surveillance technology. And they have thought carefully about how to integrate uh, communication surveillance uh, on 3G and 4G networks, where they have probably the most extensive system in the world for domestic surveillance. Um, with new kinds of hardware, with new kinds of sensors, uh, uh, with uh, cameras, uh, with facial recognition. So I think the, the, we all talk about the opportunities of 5G, which is the right approach, but one of the opportunities will be to expand surveillance. And so a good question to ask is, is what they do in China to their own citizens something that they might be interested in doing to other countries, to other countries' citizens? And I don't think you can say no. So think about, uh, we've all seen this with uh, some of the camera equipment that comes out of uh, China, some of the other equipment. Um, it, it calls home, it reports home, it sends data home. And you don't know what's in that data. Uh, you don't know necessarily um, what it's collecting. So from the sort of worst case scenario, um, the reliance, perfectly reasonable five years ago, the reliance on tech, Chinese technology in sensors and in telecom has given them a huge opportunity for surveillance. Good. Uh, Mike, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, how the FCC and the government is approaching some of these issues. Have you seen the collaboration? Is, 
is, is more needed and how, how are we doing? Sure. So I think the FCC uh, has, certainly has a compelling space in this. And, but I think you, know, you mentioned it and I mentioned it as well, this whole of government approach is really the key because the FCC alone isn't equipped to go root out the threats and figure out how to mitigate that. Um, we have many different agencies who are coming together as part of this supply chain task force to do just that. Um, and you know, they're working on solving some of the basic questions that will enable better supply chain security. Um, for instance, one of the working groups that I mentioned is really centered around how do we as telecom carriers better talk to the information gathering community and how does the information gathering community share those threats back with us? Because we have found out that the people who are in gathering intelligence about the threats don't necessarily know all of the areas of concern for the telecom space. And at the same time, that, that's the same vice versa. We don't always know what they know to ask the right questions. So how do we start asking the right questions? And once we can figure out um, a, a better approach for getting the threat information, then we can really have a solid risk management approach. But I think it's the FCC coming together with its other partners at the Department of Commerce, because there are certainly large trade implications for this. The Department of Homeland Security is the sector-specific agency for the communications sector. And they certainly have a role in the technical expertise over there to get at solving some of these threats. So it's bringing together the intelligence. It's bringing together the policymakers. It's bringing together the technical minds who have the ability to work on this and that's really what we're so excited that is happening over at the um, task force right now. Can I <clears throat> can I add just a couple of things? I, I think <clears throat> in terms of what Washington is doing, we have an, we have one really acute issue, which is the issue of how do we deal with um, uh, providing support for the small carriers. I think that's the most important one um, for a couple of reasons, and, and Nokia has spoken about this. Uh, I think. Uh, a number of times, I'm not sure if others have as well, is that <clears throat> with 5G, it's a, it's a transfor transformational technology, but missing deployment of that technology to a large part of our population base will carry with it costs that are much greater than the digital divide of the past is, is the way we think about it because of what 5G will enable in terms of transforming the economy. So I think we have to, we have to work very hard, as I said, to make sure that if, if remediation is the, <coughs> excuse me, if, re <coughs> excuse me, if remediation is the path that is chosen, that we do it in a way that does not you know, foreclose the possibility of 5G deployment for small carriers. We think that's critical. Um, in terms of the broader U.S. activity on longer-term things, I think um, what I would caution is that there's a time to take a step back and realize that a nuance isn't always fully deployed in Washington, but blunt instruments in this space are a little bit dangerous because of the collateral consequences, the ripple effect, if you will. Uh, so one consequence potentially of a, of a really confrontational ban-oriented approach is that China decides to pull out of multilateral standardization bodies, uh, which is very dangerous. It's something that we've worked very hard as, a, as an ecosystem to encourage them to participate in both to bring their technological uh, capabilities, but also for scale purposes, and we've already begun to see some some tears in the fabric of that as a result of the listing and other things. And I'm not commenting whether you should or you shouldn't do those things, but I think taking the opportunity as policymakers to underscore the importance of continuing to have a multilateral um, standards uh, processes is, is really key. And then I think. Um, Taking a look at the hygiene practices of companies before deciding that you want to implement this decoupling that Jim talked about, it's, it's in some cases not very realistic to expect that would happen quickly. Um, there are processes I know that we have are designed for security process. I assume other vendors have them, but to the professor's point, we've already through that adopted a lot of the IP security practices using forensic auditing for our software development, you know, auditing of our, of our suppliers and, um, you know, putting our, our source code in off-site places that we can always work backward if vulnerabilities are found to see who touched it when, et cetera. And so there's a lot of that that's already being built into our processes. And we should take stock of those things before we start pulling levers on doing more things that could be very disruptive to the availability of the very equipment that uh, everybody says they want. So it's blunt, 
we're past the time for blunt instruments. We need to be a little bit more thoughtful about this. It's a hard problem because the standards process is being politicized <coughs> by China. You probably saw last summer where uh, someone from Wa uh, Lenovo rashly voted for a Qualcomm standard that was the best. And when he got back to China, the CEO of Lenovo was forced to publicly apologize and say they would never do that again. So an honest standards process is good, and we need to think of tools to do that. The word we haven't used so far is grandfathering, and it's going to be a glide path to rip out the Chinese technology if we think it's necessary to do so um, out of all the carriers it's in. And you can't just say, do it tomorrow, right? So what's the glide path here? Uh, what's the funding behind it? And I think in some cases we're going to have to say for some period of time, possibly a couple years, we will need to continue to have this technology uh, on our networks. And then how do we deal with the risk that creates? I just don't see how you do it in the If you have tons of money, um, maybe we could do something different, but uh, we don't. Yeah, and so last question. Uh, I mean, on that point, um, and I know it's something that was on your mind as well, and this, again, a lot of this bleeds into what will come in the subsequent panel and panels even after that. Um, you know, how do you think about, um, you, you know, whether it's swaps or whether you're talking mm -hmm. about making sure that there's no disruption to consumers, you know, what, what do you think is a reasonable time frame for us to try to achieve you know, something that would be in the magnitude that we're talking about, um, again, given that we don't exactly know the scope, we don't exactly know how to pin down at this point, we're all thinking through which equipment should it be. What do you think, um, to the panel even, um, is, is the time frame, the approach that we should be taking here? John may want to dodge this one, and no one will blame him if he does, but <laughs> you, you might want to start by asking the carriers where their business was built on these uh, technologies. John, what would you say to that? We can, you can, well, we'll close our eyes and pretend it's not you talking. <laughs> I mean, yeah, from start to finish, uh, and when I say start, it's from you know, placing the order with the vendor, and there's probably a good three to six, oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, months or longer, you know, in you know, leading up to issuing the purchase request or purchase order, it, it, it takes two years to deploy it. The you know, the vendor they, they don't you know their, their stuff they, they do stock it, but it's not just sitting on the shelf ready to sure. deploy because there's specifics of my network that that look absolutely nothing like anybody else's network, and you know, so there's customization that has to be done, and, and then there's the uh, I want to challenge Brian a, a little bit. It is easy for you know for for those guys to do it, and they've done it. You know, they do do it. All, all day, you know, frequently. Um, we, we do it once every five years, so, you know, and I, and I do it with a staff of four, you know, who've got to worry about getting the kid to the baseball practice and, you know, making their VA appointment or um, dealing with the customer request that came in yesterday as to, you know, why my cell phone what you worked here yesterday but doesn't work today and, you know, things of that sort. So, you know, we're, we're challenged with filling out the, um, you know, the Questionnaires that come to us from the vendor when we're you know when we, once we've made a selection and you know they'll in order for the vendor to make meet their schedule they need us to return that by date X and if we don't get it to them then their schedule slips yeah. and it just kind of snowballs so yeah it, it takes you know even even in a perfect world though it's going to take you know anywhere from two years or longer to to mm -hmm. uh, affect a, a full scale you know rip and replace um, you know from the you know, whatever you establish as the, as the day one of the process. Uh, I don't mind you challenging me. Uh, I, I, I was speaking just the idea, the concept that swaps are, are not something that vendors are, are inexperienced mm -hmm. at. There are, of course, going to be nuances here. I think a couple of the driving factors will be it's an X over N calculation. In, in some cases, it's easy for us to look at a large carrier and say, okay, that's a huge uh, replacement, but we put a lot of resources on it. Here you're going to have a very large and potentially I don't know is it a couple dozen is it is it a hundred I don't know what the answer to that question is, but each one of those is is going to present its own challenges right you're going to need uh, some some instances you're you're going to have more climbing of towers than others some may have more rooftops those can go faster how many base stations how many you know nodes it's going to take what it takes and so we probably shouldn't put an artificial date yeah. on. Uh, you have to have it out by date X. Uh, I think you're probably going to have to provide a glide path for that. 
Um, I also think, like I said again, flexibility to to buy what they'll need looking forward as opposed to what is there. Part of that may just be equipment availability, right? I mean, I know we have air scale products that do 4G and 5G. I'm not sure if things that they have deployed that are LTE only we even have. So there, there we have to be flexible in timing. We have to provide certainty of funding, uh, uh, make sure we get the number right. Because uh, like I said, I, I doubt we'll get through the fun house more than one time. Yep. Uh, and, and so those are things to, to bear in mind. Um, we, we have been working on things um, for just generally uh, about can you leave a, an LTE network of, of any provider, trusted or otherwise, in place and overlay a separate 5G capability on top of it uh, in parallel uh, and secure that at, at uh, a fewer pairing points. The limitations there, uh, and by the way, this happens a lot when we we do swaps um, of, of other vendors. The carrier may say, uh, you want to do business with me in the future, you're going to open the, the radio interfaces so that we can allow the other supplier to come in and, and ride off that infrastructure. If you don't trust the infrastructure that's there, that's one question. But two is if the person you're swapping out doesn't have the prospect of more business there, they're not going to be in a real mood to cooperate on that. So the technical solutions that would allow us to design an overlay are are, are pretty challenged. I'm yeah. not saying it can't be done, but the things we have developed so far require some measure of cooperation from the vendor you're swapping out. And I don't think we can expect that here. Yeah, and if I could just add one thing, you know, it, and I think you're going to get into this in the next panel, but it really depends how deep in the network are we going for this. Is it, you know, is it the layer one, layer two equipment? You know, the NDAA made certain decisions about this. The EO requires DHS to go and do its own analysis that we are actively working with them on now to figure out what is critical. Because if everything's critical, as we frequently say, then nothing is critical. So how do we make those determinations and really getting to the heart of the problem and figuring out what is the most important to be replaced will directly affect the timing. Yep. Good. We're going to have a five minute break here, bring the next panel up at 11. Thank you all for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, um, push is hard, okay. um, is my advice. Sit on okay, I'd like to go ahead and get started uh, with, the second, with the second panel. Uh, the second panel will consider fix it. <laughs> like this microphone. We need to fix it. This is why you need the gavel. Is it on? It's not. Okay. Uh, so, uh, welcome back. Uh, the fix it panel uh, will consider how to ensure that networks are secure. Uh, and with us, we have Carrie Bennett from the Rural Wireless Association, Bill Chotner from Ericsson, Travis Russell from Oracle, and Dalit Srahari from TIA. Uh, and let's keep the order. It worked pretty well last time. So Carrie, start us off, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carrie Bennett. I'm general counsel to the Rural Wireless Association. And it's hard to say rural wireless if you don't say it a bunch of times. So I encourage everyone to practice that a little bit. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Starks, for holding this timely stakeholder workshop on finding, fixing, and funding security vulnerabilities within our communications networks. In December of 2018, prior to be you becoming an FCC commissioner, RWA met with FCC staff and several of the then commissioners to discuss the pending national security rulemaking. In those meetings, RWA requested um, that the FCC hold a, a meeting such as this. And so, you convening this shows us that you're a man of action, and we appreciate it, because in the short time that you've been here, you've taken the initiative and pulled this together. And I know Randy helped you um, pull it together, and we appreciate his hard work on this and all the rest of your staff, but thank you so much. It's so important to us. Um, we have issues with our members who have um, deployed Huawei and ZTE, and as you heard from one of our members earlier on the earlier panel, um, it was to make efficient use of funding, very limited funding that they had in their networks. And nothing that our members did were illegal. Um, they were, were using the money smartly, um, and they did good work in, in deploying the services to those 
rural consumers um, and for delivering some high quality services. Just by way of background for some of you who may not be familiar with the Rural Wireless Association, we're a trade association comprised of small rural wireless carriers. Each of our members serve under 100,000 subscribers. Um, and in fact, most of our members serve under 10,000 subscribers and many, many just under 2,000 subscribers. So these are the small of the small. We actually encourage our members to stop being members by growing large enough to be kicked out of the association. Um, we pray for that to happen to them. Um, well, we have put a lot of detail on the record about our members' deployment of Huawei and ZTE equipment. Approximately 25% of our members have deployed either Huawei or ZTE in their networks. Um, and based on our fact gathering, we have learned that Huawei, who is also an associate member of RWA along with Ericsson and Nokia and, and many other vendors, Huawei has 40 customers in the United States. However, not all of these customers are wireless providers. Some use Huawei equipment to light up their fiber networks. So when we put forward our best estimates of how much it would cost to replace our wireless carriers members' um, equipment, it doesn't include um, those fiber networks and, ba and backhaul only networks or the wireline networks. I want to make that very clear. Um, uh, our members, we estimate, um, just to replace their equipment, it would cost somewhere upwards of $800 million to $1 billion, and that's uh, counting approximately 12 to 13 companies. Um, that's both ZTE and, and Huawei. That leaves another 27 to 35 companies that we think the replacement costs are not represented in our calculation. Um, we anticipate that the cost to replace all Huawei, Huawei and ZTE equipment will be much more, but I'll leave that to the other panel and, and the next discussion. With respect to fixing the problem, our members are concerned that the process of performing a full network migration from one vendor to another will require a significant amount of time, money, and resources. Paying for such a migration has our members concerned. Replacing network equipment while the network is in operation is not something that can be done overnight or with ease. It requires intensive planning, an enormous amount of time and effort and coordination with the customer base so as not to cause loss of service, and sometimes that's critical public safety service. RWA's members have estimated that it could take as much as four to 10 years to perform a full migration based on the size of their networks and the resources available. Our members are also concerned about being able to access labor resources as the large carriers to begin to build out their 5G networks and absorb the highly skilled labor pool. Highly skilled labor to perform a network migration may become an issue that will stretch the amount of time needed and will also increase the costs. In addition to potentially billions of dollars and long time frames that is at play to perform a replacement of existing equipment, the potential network security issues that has the federal government concerned will not be addressed during the lengthy migration time frame. If this is really about network security issues and threats to the U.S. by foreign governments, RWA believes that a more immediate, a prudent approach would be to require network monitoring by a trusted third party cybersecurity company. Our members believe that working with a trusted third-party cybersecurity monitoring service, such as a company that we've become aware of recently called Cyber Engineering Services out of Baltimore, Maryland, may be a better, more expedient course of action to truly assess the network security issues that the first panel discussed. Monitoring all communications networks, not just Huawei and ZTE networks, 24-7, 365 days a year, not just those um, of the, uh, our members who have deployed Huawei and ZTE, may be a more effective, cost-effective way, cost way to deter and prevent cybersecurity threats to our communications networks from both foreign and domestic sources. A cybersecurity threat doesn't have to come through a backdoor channel. In most cases, as we heard, cybersecurity breaches um, come through the front door being left wide open. Protecting our networks through monitoring and good cyber health is a prudent approach regardless of the equipment vendor. To the extent that replacement equipment is mandated and more importantly funded, having the capability to monitor and respond to cybersecurity threats will still re remain at a part and part of the equation. Our estimates for taking this approach for our members are less costly and are estim estimated to be under 10 million, a very affordable solution compared to a complete replacement so that should be undertaken and be considered as we move through this process. Thank you again, and we look forward to working with you on this. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, for uh, 
adding us to this this panel. You know, when we talk about 5G and, and supply chain, we, we talk about all of the knowns, the Ericsson's, the Nokia's, the Samsung, the Huawei. I'm actually here representing the fifth and probably the best kept secret in telecom, and that's Oracle Communications, which is a 5G uh, supplier. I, I think, you know, it's, it's useful for us when we talk about 5G to think of it in, in three pillars. One certainly is the RAN, the access point. Then there's the packet core, which is the path that all of our data packets take. But then more importantly, there's what we call the network core. So I think we kind of lump those together when we say core, but in reality, we have to separate packet core from network core, and, and two, uh, they work totally uh, in, in different ways. So the network core, it's important because this is where we manage all of the voice and the data sessions that's created by the RAN and the packet core. Nothing gets done or passed without the network core managing those sessions. It's what manages roaming from tower to tower and network to network. It's what manages the delivery of services to the consumer. So the network core plays a very, very important role here when we start talking about uh, 5G. Uh, 5G represents a major evolution from uh, where we have been in the past with network architecture. Uh, when, it, when I was listening to the professor's presentation, uh, there is no telecom network anymore in 5G. It's all IP. We've converted everything to a data center. We've thrown away all of the telecom technologies that old guys like me have grown accustomed to. And we've replaced it with HTTP and, and JavaScripting language. So there is no more telecom in, in 5G in going forward. This is all IT technology. And, and I think that's really important as we start considering how are we going to do any kind of a replacement in, in this type of environment, especially in the rural areas, because now operators have to start thinking, uh, where am I going to get the expertise to build a data center? if I don't have one today? Who's going to be responsible for the integration of all of this new software that's coming in? And more importantly, how am I going to secure that data center from the threats that we already see happening today on the internet? This is a drastically different skill set for all operators uh, than what we see in, in operator communities today. We should not be reliant on suppliers from adversarial nations to design, manage, and secure our critical infrastructure, especially as we start moving more towards cloud technologies. The other challenge, though, that we face is that our investments in 5G capital are going to be much more short-lived. Um, you know, SO7, we started the design of SO7 back in 1967, and we didn't deploy it to 1984, and it's still being used today. So I think, you know, we all got our money's worth out of SO7. 6G is already being worked on. We're accelerating the path for future generations of technology. And so instead of 10 and 15 years on the books, you're going to be looking at much, much shorter uh, return on the in your investment. And there was a report that ITU uh, released last year that was called Setting the Scene for 5G Opportunities and Challenges. And in that report, they concluded that the business case for 5G in rural communities may not be so strong because of that shortened ROI. There could be an alternative, though, to CapEx investment, and, and that's part of what I'll talk about today. 5G enables something that's called network slicing as a service. That particular model then allows operators to get 5G capabilities as a service, as an OPEX investment rather than a CAPEX investment. It also, though, uh, allows you to rely on your, your trusted cloud providers to both take care of, of the maintenance of that network as well as securing that network um, so that you don't have to, to worry about that yourself. So a, a trusted 5G network as a slice provider, which is a mouthful just like saying rural wireless, uh, can provide not just the cloud infrastructure but the entire ecosystem that comes along with that. Uh, and as I said earlier, more importantly, 
uh, the very important security expertise that's needed to protect the network and consumers from nefarious actors and nation state threats. As I mentioned earlier, you know, this can be delivered as an OPEX investment versus a CAPEX investment, which then leaves more CAPEX to invest in RAN replacement and in, uh, in fiber backhaul. So I look forward to our discussion in today's workshop, and uh, thanks again. Thanks, Travis. Hi, I'm Bill Chotner at Ericsson. Um, so I work in the radio access uh, products team. Um, first, I really want to thank uh, the Commission, um, Commissioner Starks and his staff for holding this important event, and also for, thank you for inviting Erickson to participate. All right, so who is Erickson? Um, most of you know we're, we don't make phones anymore, although outside of here, I don't know how many people know that. Um, Ericsson's a global wireless infrastructure provider. We enable communication service providers to capture the full value of connectivity. Uh, the company's portfolio, it spans networks, those are our radio products, digital services, this is the core products, uh, and a lot of the stuff on the back end doing analysis, managed services, and uh, emerging businesses. It's designed to help our customers go digital, increase efficiency, and find new revenue streams. Ericsson's investments in innovation have delivered the benefits of telephony and mobile broadband to billions of people around the world. I'm excited to report that just this week we announced that Ericsson is building a 5G manufacturing facility in the U right here in the U.S. This will allow us to speed delivery to our customers, resulting in faster 5G deployment. The factory will open in early 2020. All right, so the administration has identified security concerns with specific vendors. Um, you know, a couple thoughts when we look at this. One, buy and build decisions made on many of these networks were made at a time when the way one planned, deployed, and built a network was considerably different than today. They were based on, there were business decisions made that never had any idea of the national security considerations that would come today. LT networks before, they were primarily built with radios that had two transmitters and two receivers in them. They were single frequency band networks, maybe two, two bands. Um, the solutions tended to be very hardware-centric. Um, they're very purpose-built networks. But what about LT networks today? Today, we, most of the networks we're deploying today in the lower bands are primarily deploying 4T, 4R radios, and we're starting to move into massive MIMO. That could mean you could have 512 radios in a sector, as an example. Um, Multi-frequency band networks. In some cases, some of our operators are running networks with six or seven frequency bands. Um, Multi-frequency band radios. In many cases now we're deploying dual band and tri-band radios. Um, very largely software-defined networks. A lot of our customers take a software drop every week. Uh, Multi-use networks, mobile broadband, that's our bread and butter, but fixed wireless access becoming much more common now. Mission critical communications, massive Internet of Things communications, and moving into critical Internet of Things communications. So technology, where are we headed? I mentioned multi-frequency bands um, spanning all the way from, from 600 megahertz in the U.S. up to millimeter wave. Multi-frequency radios, so ultra-wideband radios that cover significant amount of frequency bands in a single radio. Multi-technology standard base stations, 3G, 4G, 5G in a single base station, single radio, single baseband unit. Dynamic spectrum sharing, so LT and 5G can dynamically share the same spectrum and really change the allocation of resources based on actual customer demand. Services, U.S. people working on networks in the U.S. Scale, Ericsson has hundreds of crews working to build 5G in our nation every day. This is a significant capability and required for this national endeavor. Tools, tools are a key multiplier of services, be it drone site inspection, video site walks, artificial intelligence and machine learning site inspection tools to identify faults. Centers of excellence to train resources. Um, yeah, Commissioner uh, Carr actually visited one of our center of excellence. Uh, he actually has his climbing certification, so he actually climbed one of our towers in there, and uh, and he actually had his own climbing gear. Um, but this allows us to we can dry run swap procedures. We can develop realistic uh, you know project timelines and procedures, seeing how long something actually takes, all in a very safe environment. Um, and then operations, including managed services, to really help develop resource competence on the new network before handing over the keys to the network. 
uh, commitment to secure networks. So Ericsson's philosophy is and has been for quite a while security on purpose. Uh, code security, Ericsson uses a holistic approach across technology and services, ensures that security is built in from the start across hardware, software development, testing, implementation, and operation. Uh, test security, all of our software is regularly scanned, compiled, and verified, ensuring tight control over our software design life cycle. Rigorous testing to identify vulnerabilities on a regular basis. Build security, deployment is critical to consider. The most secure network equipment can still be compromised if the network is not deployed in a secure manner. I think Professor Mayer brought that out pretty well, the man in the middle. Ericsson is a significant contributor to security and technology standards with groups like NIST, GSMA, 3GPP, Etsy, CDSE, and the IETF. Commitments to U.S. customers. Ericsson supplies in all four tier one MNOs in the U.S. with wireless equipment. We also supply 40 plus rural and regional MNO customers today. We have approximately 10,000 resources in North America with the majority working in the services domain. Uh, breadth and depth of product and services to ensure network swaps can be carried out in an optimized manner. Ericsson stands ready to support these customers with our technology, services, and operational support. Um, anyway, thank you again for including Ericsson in this important event. Great. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dilip Shrihari. I am Senior Policy Counsel and Acting Head of Government Affairs at the Telecommunications Industry Association, TIA. So thanks, of course, to you, Commissioner Starks, for getting all of us together this morning. Um, but also, I just want to thank the whole Commission um, for acting unanimously last year to open the proceeding on FCC USF national security. Um, and before going further, I actually want to also thank not just the other panelists on this panel, but all the panels today. Mm -hmm. I know that um, some of us take different issues, uh, approaches to these issues and have different perspectives, but I actually believe that everyone is working in good faith to try and solve a difficult problem here. Um, so TIA, as most of you know, is the trade association that represents the manufacturers and suppliers of telecom equipment. Nokia and Ericsson are members of TIA, but of course we have a large number, hundreds of members. Um, and both TIA as an association as well as our members are very active on security issues. Um, uh, certainly the commission staff in the room and probably Commissioner Starks and Randy know that TIA has pretty, pretty active commenter in the FCC's uh, proceeding in the docket. I think probably the most fulsome commenter on our side of the issue, um, you could say. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, TIA has been active in other forms as well. As was mentioned earlier, my colleague Savannah Schaefer is one of the four uh, committee co-chairs on the DHS task force um, as well. So we're participating in that work. Um, so I'll start with just sort of three basic principles that I think are important. Um, first, speed is important. Um, and we think that the Commission does need to move quickly. Uh, other agencies in the government have identified a national security risk. We shouldn't lose sight of that. And we think the Commission has a role to play here, and it needs to do that. Um, 5G deployments are beginning in earnest, and I think the marketplace needs certainty about um, what the rules of the road are going to be, and the FCC can help provide that. And also, I think we should recognize that we realize this is a global issue, that, that other parts of the U.S. government have been working um, overseas on this issue, and the more that we can do domestically to solve this problem here, the stronger that makes our messaging in terms of our global advocacy. The second point after speed is actually just to recognize that the Commission does, in fact, have a vital role um, to play here. Um, we do believe in a whole of government approach, but um, the Commission has a specific role, of course, over the USF fund. Um, but the Commission also probably has more expertise in understanding the dynamics that rural carriers face um, than some of the other security-based agencies. And we think that's important for, the, for this agency to bring to play. Um, and, and that expertise should be leveraged. Uh, and finally, I, I know this is an, an an FCC discussion, but we absolutely believe that Congress does need to pr provide funding. Um, and, and when it does so, we think it, it needs to be done in a manner where the transition costs are not drawn from other existing pots of broadband funding. We wouldn't want to see, for example, regular USF funding or RUS funding mm -hmm. diverted to this purpose. Um, I take a more optimistic view, actually, than either Jim or Brian does on, on, on the legislation, the US 5G Leadership Act. You've got Tom Cotton from Arkansas and Ed Markey from Massachusetts <laughs> on the same bill. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And all of the chatter that we've heard, and we are obviously lobbying in support of that bill, is that there's a real bipartisan understanding and willingness in Congress to do something significant on this issue. Um, 
So I, I know this is a fix-it panel, but I just want to touch briefly on all three of them, if I might. So on Find It, I think if there is a pot of money from Congress, then the commission has a tool to sort of incentivize the data collection. You sort of say, okay, we've been given a money, a pool of, pool of money by Congress. This is the number. Come forward and tell us what you have. Um, and you have to tell us what you have in order to get the funding to replace it. And meanwhile, you realize that coming down the other side is this potential ban. And so I think everyone who has this gear will have a powerful incentive if there's money there to give the commission the information that you ask for. Um, and in terms, of, and once you've identified it, then you can start prioritizing. You can use your subject matter expertise in broadband deployment to actually evaluate those claims and figure out, okay, are carriers making reasonable requests here? And to the extent that the funding pool isn't actually sufficient, you can use your expertise to start figuring out, okay, what are the greatest areas of security risk? What needs to be replaced first? What's the timing? Um, you know, and you look at what is the equipment? What is it used for? By whom? Those kinds of issues. On the fix it. Um, I wanted to point out that, you know, depending on the specific scenario, we think operators actually have a lot of options to have their um, their problematic gear replaced. Um, Carrie mentioned, you know, wireline equipment. Um, to the extent there's a problem there, and we have no reason to question what Carrie just mentioned. Um, there's actually a lot of competition. It's not just Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, right? You've got Cisco, Juniper, Adtran, Infinera, a lot of companies that are providing the fire, fiber types of products for those sort of core central office kind of equipment. And for wireless um, uh, base stations, sort of in addition to the, the, the three major manufacturers, we should also remember there's a whole ecosystem of suppliers, third-party suppliers who often buy that gear en masse and work with smaller carriers to, to, to offer turnkey solutions. Um, uh, you know, also there's been some discussion in the record about, you know, downtime, lost revenue projections, those kinds of things. It's, it's unclear at best until the data collection happens as to how realistic that is. We certainly heard, you know, from Brian that Nokia has solutions to try and do those things with no down, downtime at all. So maybe the costs would not be what we think that they would be. And just lastly on fund it. Um, We've put in the record, you know, that the number of effective carriers might be quite targeted. We don't know for sure. Um, we submitted information estimating that for wireless cell sites alone, it's um, 13 to 15 affected carriers, which is actually pretty similar, I think, to Carrie's number. 1,300 to 1,500 cell sites. There was a Reuters article a couple of days ago that quoted 2,000 cell sites. So the equipment replacement cost would be on the order of $150 million. Again, these are not apples to apples co comparisons. We're not counting installation costs, we're not counting downtime, we're not counting wireline only, but, you know, it's it's a number. Um, and as mentioned earlier, the, the Wicker bill is $700 million, which is a lot more than our estimate. We have no problem with that whatsoever, or if Congress were to increase that number, so much the better. Um, and, and finally, but on the cost issue, though, I think we should remember that even if there winds up not being completely enough money, we should have to remember that this is a proceeding about national security, and that there really is a national security security benefit to this and making sure that the consumers in the rural areas um, benefit from secure networks and are, and are on an, an even playing field. So I'll stop there and thanks again for having me. Good. Well, thank you each for that. Um, again, just in terms of, you know, uh, sailing the ship in a certain direction here for the panel, um, you know, we obviously heard about third party, party monitoring. We're all aware of, you know, the kind of rip and replace, you know, what approaches would you guys suggest generally as we think through what the fix it might mean and do folks have strong feelings recommendations that they um, feel is the, the, the best path forward? Go ahead. Oh, okay. So I think to some extent you're going to find that a certain amount of this network is going to need to be replaced. Um, and granted that might be a little bit self-serving as well. but. When we look at this, and you ultimately have to prioritize, certainly uh, software defined. There's a lot of software defined in the network, and it's going more that way. Um, you know, I mentioned I mention software drops every week to some customers. Uh, you need to look at that. You need to look at how much compute capability is actually in the node, and then you also need to look at the ac really the access to these interfaces, especially the open interfaces, the ones that can be easily manipulated. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so I think in general, you're going to have to replace, I think, you know, those nodes and you prioritize on those bases. That's sort of our thoughts on that. I think on on third-party monitoring or testing, for that matter, it's a, it's a really tough road to go that way. I know that the UK has tried 
looking at this, and we've heard about this from Jim as well. But consider this: you know, security testing and standards are fine for evaluating basically how well is a product built. You know, was the basic quality standards in place? It can play a helpful role. But we're talking here potentially about a situation with deliberate compromise by a sophisticated foreign state adversary, right? Think about the scenario in which someone is inserting a backdoor into code that says we're going to open a certain you know a port on the a certain IP port on the device and it's only going to be opened at 3 a.m. every six months and will allow someone to log in how do you test for that mm -hmm. right I mean without doing a forensic examination of the source code in the product and even if you did that it would be you know, a computer scientist would tell you you could probably hide that in the code, you know, pretty easily. And then, but but as Jim said, you know, Huawei has a front door, right? I mean, you're you're just talking about regular updates to the software that that you're giving these companies the ability to make. So, it's just really hard to envision technically a scenario where this kind of security monitoring is going to achieve the affected result, particularly when we're talking about a national security threat tied to a state actor. I, I just want to make a couple comments on what has been said. Um, I think the monitoring serves a purpose now in the immediate here and now. And if we really have these concerns, we need to have monitoring and we need to do the best job we can with that. And there are companies out there who can do some things, maybe not everything, but at least it's something. Um, and that's a more cost effective way while we're trying to do replacement. And we have to, I think we have to go back. I think, Commissioner, you identified this in the correct order. You said, find it, fix it, fund it. We can't fund it if we don't know what we have to fix. And I think that you, ha the Commission has, and, I, and my members may ha hate me for saying this, but you have subpoena power to go and ask Huawei and ZTE who they've sold to in the United States. I don't even think you need the subpoena power because I think they're willing to come forward and tell you who they've sold to, who they have contracts with. Um, they may have to do it under some sort of um, um, Confidentiality. Yeah, it's confidentiality with you all, but I don't think that they're not willing to tell you what they've done in the United States. And, and I say that because Huawei is a member of the Rural Wireless Association, and I've had these very conversations with them where they're willing to come forward and identify who those 40 customers are and where this network equipment is. And so once you identify it, then you can figure out, start figuring out how much it's going to cost to replace it if replacement is the way that you decide to go, or prioritizing what that replacement looks like. If it's the core, the radio access network, if it's you know components that light up fiber. I'm not a technical person, but I think the first thing we have to do to, do, to solve any of these problems is figure out how deep in, it goes into these networks and what it is. And for other companies to try to guess who have no idea, or to people to voluntarily come forward and say, it and they don't want to come voluntarily come forward unless there's a pathway to fixing it. I mean, it's it's putting the cart before the horse. And I think we all have to work as patriots, as United States citizens, and what's the, in the best interest of our country. And I will tell you, my members are, are patriots, and they will come forward, and they will talk about this, and they, they want to do the right thing. Um, they've been sitting here on the sidelines wondering what it is, you know, what all the fuss is about because they haven't seen it in their networks. And just because they haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not there, it's not lying in wait, but monitoring it is a good way to start. So, so two things, uh, one on the, on the monitoring. Um, there are actually some other countries that are thinking along the same lines, more because some of the things that we saw around SS7 and diameters. So you, you're going to see Turkcell, um, which is the software developer also for the, Turkey, they're actually in the process of building a nationwide monitoring system for security. India has been having the same discussions as well. So I think there's there's a lot of uh, regions where monitoring is is being discussed. But as a technologist, I got to say, you know, we've been monitoring networks today, and stuff is still happening. So um, I would throw air of caution there. Um, the good news is that we have time. 5G is not tomorrow. As a, as a member of 3GPP, I can tell you we're late. So the release that, that was uh, put out last year only addressed 5G radio on a 4G core network. We still have not finished defining what a standalone 5G network would look like. That specification was supposed to have been finished in December of this year. It's now being pushed off until June. 
And by the way, we're taking content out of this release and moving it to the next release so that we can make the deadline in June. So I think, you know, we have some time to work through this problem. Um, it's not something that, you know, when we think about 5G as a standalone network, we're not going to see that come to fruition, especially in, in the rural markets, for several years yet. So there's time for us to work through that. Um, great. Uh, the question of, um, maybe start with you, Carrie, but then for all, truly, this is, this is a great panel. Um, tell me how you think about the functional equivalency if we're talking about fixing it, is it something, um, if we did enter kind of a replace world, um, how do we think about the flexibility for, for folks to be able to um, install something that's functionally equivalent? Should it be something that's better? What, what thoughts, guidance would you have on that? I agree with the folks on the first panel that said, you know, if we're going to do this, let's think ahead to um, the future. and and. We've got LT now. We've got 3G. We, well, we still got 2G networks that we're operating. <laughs> so I think we see that 2G and 3G um, have a lifetime that will be over in the near future. So to the extent, for example, that that um, Pine Belt has a 3G ZTE network, that may be something that can die a, a, a death on its own anyway, because it would be natural. Um, um, but to the extent the LTE network, if if I'm using Pine Belt again as an example, if L, they have to replace the LTE network with something. A, you know, Nokia, ZT, or Nokia, or, or Ericsson, or I don't know. I just heard about Oracle today. <laughs> um, um, if they have to replace that, then I think it should be. If you're gonna, you know, for a little bit more, you can get 5G. Why not go ahead and get that mm -hmm. taken care of? Because I can tell you, John will be back in the um, mobility fund phase too, looking for that money <laughs> for that. So, um, so I think we should look ahead into that future and, and try to do that. So it doesn't have to be. Exact so it's, that that LTE network has a, a lifetime um, on it as well, and we're probably getting three or four years out on that lifetime for rural carriers. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so first of all, I think it'd be pretty hard to purchase equipment today that's not upgradable to 5G. From me, from Nokia, from just about anyone. It, the reality is anything we sell today, it's going to be upgraded equipment. Um, now, with that being said, because equipment is largely software defined, that leaves us the ability to basically limit functionality. And when the customers are ready to move to 5G and make those investments, they can, and we basically can turn it on in the software. I, I think customers will get a step function in performance. Certainly radios made today versus radios made five years ago, certainly you, you get better power performance, you get better overall network performance with those radios. Um, but I think there's, there's certain things to consider that, in general, there is going to be a bit of an upgrade effect when the customers go to these networks that they can buy today. I yeah, think, I'll echo what, what, what Bill said. I mean, uh, the customers we have today that are on uh, 4G systems are, are just making software upgrades to go to the 5G side, and, and it's going to get a lot easier, right, as we move forward, because everything now, and starting in 4G, um, we started virtualizing all of the network functions, and so it makes that migration uh, a lot simpler rather than having to rip out, you know, engineered hardware um, uh, and replacing that, so. I think, uh, frankly, the answer to this question depends on what the pot of funding is. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a large, sufficient pot of funding, such as from Congress, then I think it's a great idea to completely install new state-of-the-art equipment, you know, as these carriers are doing it. Um, if not, or if resources are limited, then maybe you have to start asking tougher questions about, okay, which equipment do we prioritize first to come out? Uh, you have, you look at what is maybe a fair, reasonable market expectation for the carrier in terms of what was the reasonable lifespan of the equipment that's being ripped out, and do we then sort of amortize the cost, the replacement funds that we give them? Do we give them, you know, so they can make their own market choices about whether they want to buy gear, um, you know, uh, that's that's completely new with new functionalities or not? I will observe that this wouldn't be the first time the commission has faced a problem like this. The TV incentive auction, the broadcaster relocation fund, mm -hmm. there were big political questions about whether the broadcasters wanted to use the money to upgrade to ATSC 3.0 instead of just doing, you know, the changing channels, that kind of thing. So I think uh, I'm not taking a position on it, but I think once there's an amount of funding available, the commission knows how to make those kinds of decisions. Um, good. M maybe start with you, Dalit. Um, 
tell me how you thought. We heard um, from Brian, um, you know, swaps and overlays. Um, how, how would you think about that um, and, and the ability, you know, is that part of this fixing it? Is that something that um, could supplant otherwise remediation? Or, how, you know, how would this process um, go? Yeah, I think it, it depends on the specific scenario. We heard from um, the Pine Belt this morning that, you know, when you're doing a replacement, you have to look at the specific carrier and go in and figure out, okay, what's what's the complexity of customization that needs to be done? Um, but I think, sure, uh, com companies like Ericsson and Nokia, I think, advertise on their websites that they do fixing with no downtime, right? So, and third-party suppliers that work with rural carriers would probably offer similar services and say, we can provide this solutions for you turnkey solutions that will come in and, and put a work plan in place that doesn't involve you losing any downtime or or any roaming revenue. The the model may be different, on the other hand, for the wireline equipment. If there's fiber equipment coming in there, then you know you may be having a different conversation. Uh, my guess is that it's doable more easily than um, than some have suggested, perhaps, but we don't really know yet. I think, but I will observe this. You know, even if we're looking at you know 13 to 15 wireless and maybe up to 40 in total, we're not talking here about a complete overhaul of all of rural America's wireless. I think we see this as sort of an isolated problem, one that's necessary to fix, but one where the commission can probably individually talk to all of the affected parties and say, okay, what's your timeline? How do we work this out? We want to help you fix it. We want to help you remove it. Um, and how best can we make that happen? I think also it, it might be worthwhile to have a conversation on, on you know, where do we see the most prominent threats. If we don't understand the threats and, and what we're trying to protect, um, then we're looking at just a blanket replace everything just for, uh, just for cause. So I think we have to have that conversation too. And that will also point to what are those critical systems uh, that provide the most exposure to our networks. And, and that's going to be different, you know, in, in each of the networks, as, as we've uh, we heard in the previous panel. Um, but I think we've got to understand what the, what the threats are that we're protecting against. And a migratory approach is, is perfectly fine. I mean, we've been doing this, uh, as has Ericsson and Nokia, for many, many years. Uh, it's a lot easier for us to go in on a network that's operating mm -hmm. and make that migration than it is on a network that uh, has had a problem and we're having to come and pick up the pieces. And, and we've, <laughs> we've been in both of those positions. So uh, it's much easier uh, to, to look at that problem today and make that migration. Um, and I know we heard you talk about it a little bit, Travis, um, but Bill and, and folks as well. Um, how have you seen Europe or other countries that are thinking through this kind of fix-it piece? You know, do you have any yeah. guidance there? Yeah, so uh, I, I think it was actually talked about quite a bit in the previous panel. Brian, yeah. Um, yeah, so in Europe, when you look at the approach, I think in general the EU is, has really come out and said, we do need to address this. Every country needs to look at this and, and come up with some standards. What's not really there is a framework to tie them together. We have Italy and France. They've come out. They've actually come out with some standards already. Uh, Poland and Sweden are in the process of developing them. You have the UK and Germany that have said this is very serious. We need to look at this in depth and take it seriously. I think the objective of the EU is to get everybody together at the end of the summer and see what's come out. But. There's actually nothing that says everybody has to agree, and that makes it pretty difficult. These networks interconnect. So it, it's pretty hard to fathom how that's actually going to work. But I think it's a bit early to say what exactly the EU approach is. I, I think it's worth understanding the difference in context. Um, you know, here, first of all, we're talking about a pretty small problem here numerically, maybe less than 1% of cell sites, a few fiber, that kind of thing. In the EU, Huawei's presence is much larger, mm -hmm. right? I think I've heard 30 to 40% something. They, so they have a very different problem there. And we should also realize, you know, the EU, they, I think they don't make these decisions necessarily as an EU as a whole. Some of them are making it on a nation state basis. That's just sort of how the European Union is set up. We also need to realize that, you know, the United States is, the world's leading superpower. We are, you know, the leaders of NATO. China is a, is a significant adversary for us. Our national security needs and posture are probably different on this issue, 
you know, potentially than, than what individual member states in the European Union might do. So I, I don't, while I respect, you know, what some of the EU countries are trying to do in terms of, in terms of mitigate, mitigating these issues, I think we have to remember our national security needs and overall global posture are different, and I think we need to take that into account. Yeah. There's a difference, too, um, what you hear on the government side versus the operator side. I mean, you saw British Telecoms already announced, we're just ripping everything out, out of 3G and 4G. Um, that came out after the GCHQ report, and my assumption there is that when they saw the results of that report, they decided, you know, cost of ownership here is much higher, right, than, than uh, what you pay up front. But I'm hearing from other operators. I mean, uh, there was a small operator that came to me at Mobile World Congress that said the same thing. We're ripping them out entirely. And, and uh, so I asked him kind of sheepishly, well, why would you do that? He said, haven't you heard? There's a security problem. So, so operators have um, in, in Europe, they are taking this seriously and they are making independent decisions from their governments. Um, so I think it's, you know, we have to, to talk to the operators too uh, to see what their, their temperature is. Tell me what, um, for the panel, tell me what disruption to everyday Americans l looks like here. I know, <laughs> you know, part of this also is what we've been doing all day, which is, you know, the framing. How big is it actually? How much would it, you know, third-party monitoring obviously is something that would not have much of a disruption. But if we did go to a, a rip and replace model, how would we think through how to minimize that disruption to everyday consumers? Obviously, we have, you know, most prominently people need to be able to call 911, but there's, you know, a whole lot of things that people obviously look for their telecom services to do. But how would we think about disruption? Well, from the perspective of folks who live in rural America who are dependent on these rural carrier networks, it depends on whether this is going to be funded because I think I can tell, speak on behalf of my members, we can't do it on our own. They can't do it on their own. It has to be funded to do it. Then there's a process that has to go into play about migrating from the, exist, the customers from the existing network to the new network. And that has to be done very carefully and with very good intentions of not dropping customers off the network. And something that we haven't mentioned is spectrum. Is there enough spectrum? Because you're going to be operating two networks at the same time. And is there sufficient spectrum to do that in the migration process? Um, so, so those are the things you just don't want to, and I'll talk to Urban America in a, minute, in a minute, because so much goes on in rural America. Our oil and gas industry is out there, our renewable energy resources, agriculture um, production that is all connected now to the internet and you know John Deere uh, manufactures these pr huge precision agriculture machines that are operating and need access to the internet too so that we can get our food supply so we talk about you know the, the chain supply here the equipment chain supply but we have a food supply that needs to get into urban America um, so we just don't want to disrupt all of those things in this process and it has to be very a very very careful process for any migration and I want to get back to the timeline. You know, we've seen you know Congress look at you know with the NDA adding the I think um, the the White House said you know give them you know get some four years to get this done. And I think if we are beholden to a timeline, not every one of these companies can do it all at the same time because we have limited resources to do that. So, um, and I'm not talking about the carrier's limited resources, I'm talking about the labor pool. You mean like crews? And, yeah, uh, yeah, crews, tower crews, and if they're all being hired by the four nationwide carriers to deploy 5G because we're in a race to 5G, how are we going to put the resources on helping rural carriers and rural Americans satisfy what, what we come up with? So I think we need to have a safety valve on whatever timeline we have so that we can come to the commission or the powers that be, whoever that might end up being, and say, look, we're trying really hard, and this is you know, the line that was drawn in the sand, but we may need some more time to effectuate this. But meanwhile, we are doing other things like the monitoring um, to take care of it. So um, the other concern that I just want to raise is, is from the perspective of you know, Huawei and ZTE, if we're telling them, you're out. Are they going to keep supporting this while we do a transition? And who's going to come in and help, you know, keep the existing networks up and running if um, they're told they're out? Um, and so that process has to be, um, I think, negotiated with them very carefully as well, so that we just don't have a complete shutdown of the existing existing networks. I think it's worth remembering that, you know, 
these kinds of transitions and equipment replacements do happen all the time, all across America. Carriers, large and small, are upgrading their gear and doing so without having their services go down. Um, also, you know, I, again, we don't know, we don't have complete data yet, but if we take the assumption that the universe of gear that needs to be replaced for this specific problem is relatively small, larger to the huge number of deployments that are going on across the country anyway, I don't know necessarily that, you know, there's a, maybe unlike the TV auction and moving, moving channels, that this would be sudden, uh, like a huge problem in that regard with like platoons of crews needed to go all over the country to do this at once. I think we need more data on that to find out if this is um, really going to be a, an issue on that front. Um, and you, you know, obviously um, thinking through Ericsson's announcement on a manufacturing plant here in America. Um, and probably to you as well, Travis. You know, tell me about, uh, you know, um, how we should be thinking about American manufacturers' ability to, to help with this as well. Okay, so I guess the first thought, first of all, this is a very services intensive effort to replace these networks. And services is all U.S. people doing work in the U.S., as I said earlier. So first of all, that's, that's the bulk of the cost here. This isn't really an equipment issue. It's more of a services drives up the cost of these, these swaps. Um, in, in terms of, you know, yeah, we, yes, we built a factory. We're going to be manufacturing some of our 5G equipment in the US. Uh, certainly the massive MIMO radios will be the first thing to come out. Um, I think in terms of, we look at this and say, look, this is largely work for the U.S. in the U.S., and that's, even though Ericsson's not a, U, even though Ericsson's not a U.S. company per se, this is still largely work, and it's still happening for by U.S. people in the U.S. to make these networks safe and secure. So two approaches, I mean, um, you know, we look first, uh, I'll call it on-premise equipment replacement, right? So that's for the operators that choose to, to purchase the software and implement it in their own private cloud on, on their own premises. And then the second option that I alluded to earlier um, is going to a cloud provider and getting the software as a service. And certainly, you know, in the latter, um, there's very, very little disruption involved. You just, you, you need that connection, obviously, into the cloud, but uh, for cloud customers, I mean, you know, we do updates every day. Uh, we do uh, maintenance updates every day. Uh, without any any type of disruption, so I, I think it depends upon you know are they is an operator going to want to build their own data center and stand up their own 5G uh, core network uh, in their own premise, or are they open to looking at a software as a service model? Yeah. Well, we went a little over there. If there's any last thoughts, um, we're going to catch our five minute break before the next panel. But go ahead if you have. Sure. I was just going to say on the. Uh, on this issue about U.S. manufacturing, first of all, on the wireline side, there are any number of American companies that produce the fiber-based equipment. I know when we talk about the the RAN side, you know, people say, okay, Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, those are two European companies and a, and a South Korean company. Um, but even there, we have to remember uh, ICT supply chains are global. The products, you know, even American companies, you know, may have products that are manufactured, some parts in, in China, Mexico, Southeast Asia. You know, we've talked in the a lot about the need to focus sort of upstream in terms of manufacturers on just focusing on logic enabled products and uh, components and not focusing on every power supply or or screw or piece of sheet metal that kind of thing so we're also wary of the US sort of imposing kind of um, buy America or US industrial policy requirements here that could have negative trade consequences mm -hmm. in some sense that's what China is doing we don't want to necessarily emulate that I think we lead by investing in wireless R&D and making sure that we're ready to develop the best new technologies by American companies through U.S. universities and research institutions and, and attack the problem that way rather than sort of through an industrial policy kind of approach. Good, good. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Reconvene and get started with uh, our third panel on funding, the Fund It panel, uh, recognizing that national problems 
require national solutions. Uh, and with us on this panel, and thanks everybody for sticking around, uh, is uh, Jeff Johnston from CoBank, uh, Alexi Maltus from Competitive Carriers Association, and Chris Reno from the Union Telephone Company. Uh, let's switch things up, if you don't mind, Chris. Can Ooh. we <laughs> can we can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank right. you. Um, good afternoon. Now, I guess it is, and uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Starks, for leading the commission's effort to um, solve a problem that, as you've heard here today, threatens to decimate the investment in mobile networks, putting rural Americans even further behind than their urban counterparts. Founded in 1914, Union Telephone Company is a family-owned and operated company providing mobile broadband, landline, and broadband services throughout vast areas of Wyoming, northwestern Colorado, parts of Utah, Ohio, and Montana. Our mobile broadband network includes 418 cell sites connected with fiber, microwave, uh, fiber and microwave to our switch located in Mountain View headquarters to the greatest extent possible, provided our customers with tools and capabilities that are comparable to those in urban areas, we support the FCC's goal in this regard. Our founder, John D. Woody, was a tech leader 105 years ago when he understood the power of basic connectivity. Today, the company continues that vision, having invested over $48 million in 3G and 4G broadband over the past four years as well as $30 million to build regional fiber in remote parts of Wyoming in just the past seven years. Of that $48 million for mobile broadband, $27.5 million has been for equipment, $12.4 million for software, and eight point six million for installation and optimization costs. The Woody family has asked me to appear before you today because when investments get made, they go through my office. I'm a CPA with over a 32-year career I've been the financial, chief financial officer of the Champlain Telephone Company in upstate New York, and I'm now a union's chief accounting officer. I know our network's inside and out, and I've spent an enormous amount of time working the finance side of the problem we're talking about today. My remarks here apply to a number of other rural carriers and broadband providers that have been working to solve this problem in places like Colorado, Tennessee, American Samoa, Alaska, Oklahoma, and Kansas. When we use the words rip and replace, we're not talking about replacing a battery in an automobile. A mobile broadband network is a complex web of switching equipment known as a core, equipment at each cell sites known as the radio access network or the RAN, and associated equipment to move the traffic among the cell sites. The core and the RAN equipment on each tower speak, to a un speak in a unique language. As of today, we can't just replace the core and continue with the RAN, and as it all has to go. Um, this is a complex problem because we need to build a parallel network on top of our existing network. Our crews will need to climb hundreds of towers to place new equipment and remove old equipment. We can put up new equipment at a rate of approximately 15 towers per month, and we have up to six months out of the year when weather permits us to do this work. We're often limited uh, by issues on federally managed lands, such as permitting and wildlife management. Right now, in fact, we have a tower that our guys can't climb because the tower next door has raptors on it. So we, we just have to wait until they're done nesting. Um, we estimate that a rip and replace would take approximately seven years for us to complete. Importantly, it will also adversely affect our plans to continue expanding our network. As a small company in a remote region, we have limited resources. There are only so many tower climbers, and you've heard this already today, and there's only so many dollars available to solve this problem, to maintain the network and repair outages and upgrade facilities all at the same time. Uh, in short, the opportunity cost of going through this exercise is enormous. Every dollar and man hour spent on the project represents resources that don't expand coverage, don't build fiber to our towers, and don't improve broadband in rural areas or help our communities. To give you a sense of the dollars, I've looked at our network and estimated the cost of replacing what we have with the network from one of our remaining vendors. If it were possible to do so in an immediate rip and replace, I estimate the total cost to be $8 million to replace the core, $75 million to replace the RAN, and $2 million to replace the backhaul and related equipment for a total cost of $85 million. 
These numbers include the cost of purchasing new equipment and labor needed to do the work. If the replacement is extended out over a longer period, as we believe it must in order to provide time to switch out the RAN equipment, the cost will come down depending on the length of time given. For a company our size, a rip and replace solution is an extraordinary expense that we could not bear, nor is it something that could be funded from our current universal service support as those funds are being used for operating expenses to maintain our network and capital expansion. I'm confident that this is the case with respect to each of the other affected rural carriers as well. Let me spend a moment to offer you a proposed solution that could be far less expensive and much more effective than rip and replace. We've been advised by our experts that there is an ocean of equipment and components currently present in our telecom internet ecosystem sourced in China, likely by a company that is under the same obligation to China's government as Huawei. These components are likely present within most major equipment manufacturers gear, whether it be a small home router or sophisticated enterprise class equipment. In other words, ripping and replacing our equipment or the equipment of a few mobile broadband, broadband carriers is not going to make the U.S. even 1% more secure. We urge you to investigate the possibility of developing a mechanism that does not trust any vendor, whether it be through the FCC, through its equipment certification process, or other branches of the federal government, it's possible to set up a facility into which equipment makers submit hardware source code for review and approval. We're advised that the cost of such a facility drops dramatically over time as it scales up, and it would be an estimated $50 million to run over 10 years. I'm attaching to my testimony a presentation that we've given to Senators, Warp, Senators Warner and Rubio in response to their briefing last month, which describes how a trusted delivery mechanism can work to secure our networks. We think it deserves your consideration. And let me close by saying that we are patriots. Members of the Woody family have served the United States military since World War II. You have our commitment that we will do our part to advance the nation's best interest. There are no qualifiers on this. We're here to help, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Starks and Randy, for the opportunity to appear here today. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Competitive Carriers Association, CCA, uh, the nation's leading association for competitive wireless providers. Uh, we represent wireless carriers ranging from small rural providers serving fewer than 5,000 customers to regional and nationwide carriers serving millions of customers. And we also represent vendors and other service providers throughout the wireless ecosystem. Critically, a lot of our members are providing service where there is no other provider offering service that or has the incentives to deploy in the area. Supply chain security is a complex topic, and as you noted earlier, it is one that requires multiple parts of the government to come together and work with industry to develop a solution. CCA continues to watch closely the FCC proceedings, administration action, uh, other legislation that would prohibit certain equipment that could cause a national security threat. The FCC, as the principal regulator in the communications industry, certainly has an important role to play, uh, and we thank Commissioner Starks for your leadership on this issue. Uh, we also thank Chairman Pai for his continued attention to the issue of hardening our nation's networks, and we at CCA want to be a productive part of any dialogue with government and industry to figure out a solution moving forward. All CCA members, including providers that have Chinese manufactured equipment in their networks, care deeply about national security. They want to take whatever steps are necessary to ensure the security of their networks. Many of our members, including particularly rural members that are most affected by some of the supply chain issues, live and work in their local communities. They're providing connectivity to neighbors, to local businesses. The security of their networks is an ever-present part of their operations. And oftentimes, as I said, they're the only service provider in part or all of their footprint. To provide service to rural and remote areas, many providers have installed network equipment pursuant to universal service competitive bidding mechanisms that prioritize the lowest cost equipment options for network deployments. Carriers often uh, also operate with extremely tight margins in rural and remote areas, making them particularly cost conscious with regard to their business decisions. With respect to funding and the resources that will be necessary to mitigate national security threats, we're first and foremost eager for some clarity on the scope of the national security threat and the scope of any remediation efforts that will be necessary. 
all carriers, including companies that have Chinese equipment in their networks, need to have certainty so they can plan their businesses and move forward. We continue to have a dialogue on what might be covered by the executive order and other government actions so that our members can know best how to move forward. But identifying the scope of the problem has a direct impact on the costs and burdens and timing of any remediation efforts. For example, many of our members tell us that for their existing 3G and 4G networks, their radio access network or RAN is largely passive while their core is where most of the intelligence lies. It could make a substantial difference for the cost and timing uh, whether someone is having to replace equipment at a handful of core network sites as opposed to potentially thousands of base stations, some of which may be in highly remote and difficult to reach areas. Time is another dimension that impacts costs. If companies are able to cycle equipment out over their natural life cycle or take other risk mitigation steps, including virtualization, they could significantly reduce the costs compared to removing equipment immediately or on an accelerated time frame. Worker availability also affects the timing and financial uh, strain of exchanging equipment. It's a busy time generally in the wireless industry. There's demand on crews to safely perform work to upgrade existing networks and deploy additional equipment and spectrum bands. Uh, immediate new requirements for further work, work could uh, further increase demands on crews. Some of our members have their own crews on staff, but some would need to contract out. In our view, any mandates would need to be implemented very carefully. The last thing we want to do is create service disruptions, risk people being unable to call 911. Uh, if there are requirements that are not implemented precisely and with an appropriate sensitivity to the realities on the ground, we worry it could impact employment and disproportionately impact rural and low-income communities. With regard to funding sources, if carriers are required to re replace existing network equipment, we do think the 5G Leadership Act provides a sensible approach to funding the solution. As was mentioned earlier, it's a genuinely bipartisan group of senators that have supported this legislation, including Senators Wicker, Warner, Cotton, Markey, Sullivan, and others. That legislation would, among other things, establish a fund to reimburse equipment replacement, which would then be replenished through FCC auction proceeds. This bipartisan bill will help ensure that all carriers have the information and resources necessary to address security risks while also advancing U.S. leadership in 5G. So in conclusion, we're pleased to be part of this conversation, and thank you for having me today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Before I begin, I want to thank Commissioner Starks for the opportunity to participate in today's workshop to address the national security threats posed by banned equipment within our networks. My name is Jeff Johnston, and I'm the lead economist in CoBank's communication division. CoBank is a $125 billion cooperative bank that provides loans and other financial services to rural America. Our customer base includes farmers, ranchers, energy and water infrastructure companies, and communication network providers. CoBank and its commercial banking partners have $4.5 billion in loan commitments to the telecommunications industry. CoBank serves a broad range of industry verticals, including wireless, wireline, broadband, data centers, and cable infrastructure. As a mission-based organization, CoBank is committed to serving rural America. We know we have to do more than just be a senior debt lender to support rural communities. In addition to the financial services we offer to rural America, we publish articles and present our research findings to industry stakeholders, customers, and the farm credit and commercial banking system. Rural wireless operators play a critical role in ensuring residents of sparsely populated, high-cost areas have access to wireless communication services. Through their roaming agreements, these operators also serve as a critical partner to national network providers, such as AT&T and Verizon, by providing services where the aforementioned does not have network coverage. <laughs> Chinese-made equipment is being used in a number of rural communication networks. Huawei, the largest telecom equipment manufacturer in the world, is widely recognized as the price leader and has established itself as a major provider of telecom equipment to rural wireless operators. Purchasing equipment from Huawei has enabled rural operators to serve high-cost areas at reasonable rates where few if any options exist for residents in these markets. The recent executive order banning U.S. companies from buying telecommunications equipment from designated foreign companies deemed a national security threat is problematic to rural operators. From a financing perspective, 
many rural operators lack the balance sheet strength to take on additional debt to fund the capital expenses associated with replacing banned equipment. Nor do they generate enough cash flow to cover the costs associated with the executive order. We estimate that a system-wide system rip and replace of unauthorized RF, core, and optical-related equipment could cost the industry over $1 billion. Without significant government support, the lion's share of rural operators would not be able to secure the necessary funding to meet this requirement. Further, some rural operators have struggled to do business with equipment vendors outside of the executive order scope, which has left them with very few options. Telecom equipment manufacturers have been cutting staff in response to a softening market, and in some cases they have failed to respond to tenders issued by rural operators. By banning the purchase of telecom equipment from designated foreign companies deemed a national security threat, it's imperative that the government ensures other options are available to rural operators. Even if operators who have banned equipment in their networks are not required to rip and replace, they may eventually have to do so anyway. Running multiple vendor plat platforms in a network can increase operating expenses, which is something these companies can ill afford. For example, when new products and services are introduced, they would need to be developed and tested against multiple platforms. This increases operational complexity, which will put pressure on margins and could negatively impact network access. Even in the best of times, funding such a program would be a major challenge for rural operators. The wireless industry is entering the maturity phase of the product life cycle, which is characterized by slowing growth and margin compression. <coughs> Capital and operating expenditures are being scrutinized, and operators are challenged to find new revenue streams. We think it's important that all these factors be taken into account when determining how to address the national security threats posed by banned equipment within our communications networks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and um, on your billion dollar number, um, can you tell us how you built up to that or how you think about it, what your factors are? Um, I mean, I think a lot of us are trying to get our heads around working up to a number. I'd be yeah. eager to hear how the variables that, that, that come into thinking. Sure, about. sure. So the, the approach we took was, uh, from, a, from an RF perspective, we, we took a per cell site estimate as to what we think it would cost to rip and replace equipment on the cell sites. And you know, I can tell you uh, two operators alone have over a thousand sites that are impacted by, um, or that have Huawei or ZTE equipment in them. So there's a thousand sites right off the bat. Um, the number is probably, you know, probably 8,000, maybe 10,000 sites. It would be my estimate based on the analysis that we've done. So, so then the question becomes, okay, well, how much does it cost to rip the existing RF equipment, the BBU, the remote radio heads out of the site um, from an equipment perspective and then also from a, uh, from a labor perspective? So that, that number you know, gets you somewhere around, I mean, best guess, it's somewhere around $70,000 a site is what we estimate, um, you know, sort of a, whether it be a Nokia or an Ericsson or, or non-Chinese-made uh, supplier. So that, that, that's the biggest component, right, which is the RAN component. The, the other component would be the core, and admittedly it's a little bit tricky to know what the core replacements would cost because you could adopt a, a more virtualized core platform that would be a little bit cheaper, but you have to make some assumptions around what those, you know, what those numbers are. And then, and then the one that, that I, that's a little bit of a black hole is on the optical side, right? So how pervasive is this equipment inside of optical networks, right? Is it just limited to rural operators or are there other operators that have this in their networks? I don't know the answer to that. So that's a little bit of a, of a guess. So if you add it all up, again, with the core representing by far the lion's share of the expenses, um, you, you get to a, you know, a little bit north of a billion dollars based on, on the assumptions that we made. Good. Um, <clears throat> Again, kind of the general set the sale question here. Uh, you know, obviously heard the number that you think for your um, for your system. Heard the the, the macro number. Uh, are there ways to, or, or you know what, Chris, if you wanted to talk to how you got to your um, your number as well, maybe that'd be helpful just as a framing perspective. And then the the, the follow up question to the whole panel will be: um, Are there ways to reduce that number at all, or is it like the numbers the number? Sure. Um, <clears throat> 
the $85 million, I, I broke it down uh, between equipment and, and labor and, and those kind of things. Um, the, the real issue becomes timing, right? And, and how deep in the network do we go? Is it just a core? Is it, does it go all the way down to, like, like everybody has said, so all the way down to the optical gear? What, how far down into the network is, are we gonna go? What is, is. Um, we've projected that in, if we get four to five years, it, the cost kind of levels out and the replacement can be rather organic, which is how we got to where we are, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it's, what, what we've spent is about half of what it would cost to rip and replace in the next year or two. So that's where we're at. And, and so it's really the glide slope that um, gives us some financial relief. Yeah, we think about this really as sort of a matrix with a couple of different dimensions. So one dimension would be time. Number of years can make a huge difference, both in terms of securing um, the crews that are necessary to do this, the ability to cycle some of the equipment out on its natural lifespan. And then the other dimension is uh, the scope within the network. So is it core, RAN, backhaul, other components of the network? and you know, you can sort of imagine a grid where the cost can can change depending on each of those uh, each of those dimensions. Uh, but certainly, a long glide path can help make a significant impact. And then, you know, maybe as another option around reducing costs, potentially, um, maybe what we could do is look at where you aggregate volumes across all of the impacted carriers. So it's just not individual purchase agreements, for example, with the, the supplier that's replacing the incumbent. It might make it a little bit easier on the supplier. Um, you'd have larger volumes, might be able to negotiate some better pricing. So just sort of that buying consortium concept, if you will, you know, might also help reduce some of the costs. Yeah, tell me a little bit more how to think about that, because obviously we are talking about a, a potentially massive amount of, you know, rip and replace equipment, if that's the, the, the way that the government decides to go. Um, and, you know, we'd need new vendors to, 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 to come in and replace that. So, you know, would it be simply turning to a number of other vendors, um, seeing if we can get that pricing? Obviously, we heard earlier some uh, private companies were able to think through whether there was a way to kind of finance some of that even from the private side. Some of those could help reduce some of these costs? Yeah, I mean, in theory, I think yes, but the devil's always in the detail yeah. of this kind of stuff, right? So executing it, I think, is could be a big challenge yeah. um, as each operator has unique requirements that would need to be met. Um, and it's sort of a fragmented uh, base of, of operators, so I think the devil's in the details, but in theory, it seems like that, that might help. Can folks tell me, uh, how do some of the smaller carriers um, naturally seek and, and go to some of the capital markets to help with some of their um, network build-outs, just, just generally, conceptually? How, how do you guys think through that? Sure. We've been lucky enough to be partners with CoBank for over 10 years. Um, been fantastic to work with. They understand us, and we're in constant contact with our, our people there. Um, just been a great market for us. Okay, great. Yeah, and I would say certainly, you know, commercial banks like us is obviously an option, uh, as Chris alluded to. Um, there's all the regional banks as well where they can get access to capital, um, perhaps through RFTC or RUS um, type of loans and so forth or other options. But I think the important, you know, for, from a capital perspective, I think the important thing to, to kind of keep in mind here is as a, as a bank, when, when we're responding to a, a loan request, right, we're looking at the borrower's ability to repay that debt, mm -hmm. to service that debt. And, and in the case of a greenfield network deployment, right, where all of the capital that's being spent is going to generate incremental revenue for the enterprise, uh, in rural kind of high cost areas, the business case doesn't even work out in a lot of cases, right? <clears throat> so you need that government support in order to, uh, or some kind of support in order to uh, be able to service the debt and, um, and service the customers. So, so again, that's a, that's a greenfield deployment. That's when we're spending capital to generate new revenue. What we're talking about here is potentially spending capital just to maintain existing revenues, right? So the, to the, 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 the business case gets that much more difficult from a, from a funding perspective when there is no incremental revenue. Mm -hmm. I mean, some operators are talking about having to spend one times uh, uh, annual revenues in capital just to, to rip and replace all mm -hmm. of this equipment. So just to put that into perspective, Verizon, AT&T, they spend roughly 15% of their annual revenue in capital. 
and that's generating new income. We're talking here of potentially a one-to-one -one relationship between capital and revenue just to maintain the existing revenue. So really, really challenging from a, uh, from, from a financial perspective to make all those numbers work. Yeah. It's impossible, actually. And, and it's important to note, like, like Jeff said, that it is just maintaining our existing revenue stream. And just as importantly, from our perspective, from a rural perspective, that doesn't allow us then to deploy new equipment into new places, into new areas. You know, we're, we're currently undergoing fiber to the prem um, deployments in various areas in Wyoming and, and building backhaul, um, you know, in fiber in places that it's never been. Um, but if we have to divert all of our resources to rip and replace just to maintain existing revenue, that's a huge opportunity cost for us. Yeah. Um, maybe, Alexi, t you know, tell me how you th think the approach um, should this be completely government funded? Um, should we, um, should there be a different approach? You know, obviously if we have some, some private partnerships with some of the equipment makers, maybe that's a different way. Um, should some of this fall on the rural providers themselves? How, how would you tell us to think about that? Sure, well I think the starting point, as was mentioned, is that for a lot of these carriers, they're in locations where there hasn't been a business case absent some support even to start with. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these networks were built um, and required universal service funding or state funding to even make the case to do initial deployments. These are some of the most hardest to reach, high cost areas of the entire country, and they're often the only one out there. Um, historically, there have been some challenges for smaller carriers to even obtain the kind of equipment they, they need, whether it's you know the latest handsets and getting access to the, the latest handsets on the same schedule as larger uh, providers. Um, you know, we started to hear today that there are vendors out there that want to be a part of this solution. I think that's great. The conversations are starting. But if there's funding from, you know, for example, the 5G Leadership Act, that mm -hmm. really can change the, the dynamic. It can, uh, it can really provide a path forward for some of these carriers to continue to serve and invest in their networks uh, in these challenging areas. Um, and it obviously brings more people to the table. I mean, I think it's going to be it's going to be a vital part of the solution yeah. going forward. Yeah. Um, conditions potentially on money. Let's say it comes from Congress. Um, how would folks think about that? You know, should there be other conditions? Um, you know, I've heard mention uh, obviously that. Particularly, we're talking about vindicating a national security interest. We want to make sure that the carriers follow through on actually um, um, ripping and replacing if that's the policy cut that we make. Are, are there, does that sound like a condition that makes sense you would recommend? Are there other conditions that would make sense to otherwise associate with this pot of money that could ultimately uh, go to funding um, um, what we're talking about here? I spend three quarters of my time doing reporting to either the FCC or some <laughs> state or another. So one more report isn't going to be all that much of a difference to me. Yeah. I, I think, you know, our members tell us, look, we want to do the right thing. Just yeah. tell us what that is. Tell us what the scope of this is. I think if the answer becomes clear, X is what needs to get done, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think we're looking for that clarity. Okay. Um, the, um, um, I think the last question that I had uh, is going to be um, something that we think about here at the commission almost every day, uh, which is, is anyone else feeling that, that oh, trembling yeah, right sorry. there? I just felt that. I guess we're, we're really making the, the world move here. <laughs> we're making the world shake. Yeah. Um, you know, how, how does this overall effort dovetail with what, um, like I said, truly, I know my commissioners and I think about, which is how do we get more broadband out everywhere um, to make it more ubiquitous that um, rural folks uh, are not left behind anymore? Um, y y you know, how does this factor in to something like that that we're working on every day? Sure. I. Um like I said, it, it can be something of a distraction. But let me start by saying um, we aspire to be rural. Um, our landline territory is about 7,400 square miles. And we've got less than 5,000 subscribers. So um, someday we hope to be rural. Um, so if, if we're forced to do this rip and replace 
in short order. Like I said, it's going to divert our resources from bringing serious broadband to our subscribers to just maintaining our existing revenue stream. It's going to put us a couple of years behind in our deployments. Yeah. I mean, the, the carriers that are most affected are the ones that are doing exactly that. They're doing the rural broadbands. They're, they're serving these communities that are otherwise underserved or unserved altogether. Um, I am concerned that in the current environment there's just a bit of paralysis because companies don't know how to move forward. How do I invest if I don't know what is going to be acceptable and what's not going to be acceptable? So I think we need to resolve some clarity that can give all these businesses some certainty that I know how to invest and I know how to put together a business plan that's going to be consistent with national security yeah. interests. And I think, you know, if we don't put the right resources to this problem, you know, given that we're talking about areas that are extremely costly to serve with very tight margins, I, I worry about the impact on companies if we're not funding appropriately and we're not being precise with the requests. Yeah. Okay. I agree with all that. Well, good. Any final, final thoughts from the panel? Otherwise, thank you so much um, for coming and giving thoughts and guidance. Thank you for telling us about your business, sir. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, with that, I think we're going to call it a day. Thank you for everyone for coming out. Obviously, um, you know, we've been at this for three and some change. Uh, there are, this is multivariable, multifactorial calculus that we're doing here. Um, and I think it is clear that this is a complex problem. Uh, it's something that we're getting a lot of expertise from folks on, but. Um, uh, we're starting the hard work, and we're going to keep plowing ahead. We'll look forward to the ongoing dialogue with all of you that are also interested in this. So thank you for coming out, hearing us today, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you.